Contemporary Chinese grand strategy depends heavily on China's perception of what it is to be China, including its geographic extent, its morally justified behavior as a political system, and all of these affect its relationship with its neighbors. Chinese will fight or not fight according to whether an object that they're fighting over appeals to their principle of justice. And so to do that, to come to an understanding of what the Chinese will fight for, because a lot of a society's identity is path dependent and comes through history, we need to look at the origins of China's self-identity. That will, in many ways, and its evolution will inform us what China will fight for and what it won't fight for, and therefore the outlines of of our ability to predict China's grand strategy in response to external security threats. China historically, depicted here in the chart on the top in red, was very uh, fertile uh, part of the world and therefore had a very large population and therefore had the critical mass necessary for the evolution of complex ideas, uh, philosophies, and technological developments. So China has typically, in the uh, age of settled agricultural societies, been a significant, if not the most significant polity in the international system. However, it was isolated between the mountains of the Himalayas and the grasslands and the steppe and the deserts of uh, what is today the Russian Far East in the north and Mongolia and the Gobi Desert and by the Pacific Ocean littoral and by the mountains of Southeast Asia. So it played a less significant role than many of the maritime powers such as those of the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean and uh, what is today Indonesia in Southeast Asia. So China's economic presence today is not so much a revolutionary emergence as a re-emergence and a re-establishment of China's relative economic power that it had at the end of the 1800s. This is the time of the French Revolution and Napoleon when France was sufficiently strong to resist any European encroachment. It had a government strong enough to be able to collect the taxes to organize the military uh, to resist foreign encroachment, even though the government at the time, the Qing Dynasty, was ethnically Manchu and not Chinese. So you had a, a, a essentially a foreign ethnic group ruling China, but within the practices of traditional Chinese culture, which made it uh, politically legitimate uh, to the Chinese people. So a significant aspect of China's contemporary foreign policy is reclaiming status and geography, territories that were lost during the century of shame in the 19th century, which is a period around 1800 uh, to the period of around 1900, 1911. So a relative decline in China was brought principally by industrialization in Europe and Japan starting in the mid 19th century that rendered China susceptible to military conquest and to the stripping away of tributary states. Although most of these territories are not eager today to rejoin China and some like Hong Kong and Taiwan actually prefer autonomy or independence, which uh, brings into question the strength and the benefits of having a common Chinese identity for Chinese people. In other words, there are other competing identities, and these exist even within China itself. Uh, for example, the British and French twice uh, punitively invested Beijing in 1860 and 1901. So China was attacked and its capital in the north was occupied in both instances. You can see, again, if you look at the chart on the top, uh, which ranges in the last 2,000 years, that China represented about 25% of the world's GDP until about 1850, which is when industrialization spread from England onto the European mainland in places like France and uh, Germany and Holland. Here you can see the spheres of influence that 
emerged within a week in China as the maritime states of Europe and the terrestrial influence from the Russian Far East penetrated through the infrastructure. And in many cases, this penetration was accompanied by uh, the construction of railroads and ferries that would navigate up these rivers. Uh, these penetrations were not uncontested. Uh, there was the Opium War, the Arrow War. Uh, the French, in fact, tried to encroach in China from Indochina, which you can see at the southern bottom part of this map, and they were defeated by the Chinese. So it was not uh, uncontested, but it was relentless. And the regime had a nationalism issue because the government uh, was not Chinese, it was Qing. And so it frequently would manipulate Chinese nationalist sentiment in order to deflect its own uh, illegitimacy. Uh, the issue of European penetration was a large one for the Marxists because they predicted a world war would occur once China had been consumed by uh, European colonialism, an event that never ultimately occurred. China was able to navigate through great power politics and was never fully occupied, in large part because the Western powers maneuvered against each other and against Japan to allow any one state to completely invest and dominate China politically. During the century of shame, there were really two sets of territories that were lost. The first were territories that were directly governed by the Qing dynasty from Peking and territories of, uh, that were tributaries, states or uh, governments that either uh, paid tribute to China or deferred to China in their foreign policy. And this is important because they extended China's uh, sphere of influence as the great central power, Zhongguo, basically the Middle Kingdom, the kingdom in the middle of all the other regime. So you can see here a list that was uh, initially released in 1954. Uh, Taiwan, the Republic of China, actually supports many of these claims uh, when the Guomintang government uh, was in power in Taipei. Today, with the new regime in Taiwan, uh, they're far less likely, um, although they have not officially uh, rejected uh, the old claims made by the Guomintang. In 1992, the National People's Congress passed the law of the territorial sea and contiguous zones to reassert influence uh, over parts of these uh, territories. So in terms of the territories, you can be Sakhalin Island, which was uh, uh, seceded to uh, Russia and then it and, and Japan. The Northeast Frontier Area, uh, which was uh, ceded to uh, India. Uh, the Sulu Archipelago, which today forms uh, part of the Philippines. Uh, 1826, the British uh, detached Assam onto India. And then you've got the Aigun Treaty Concession, the Peking Treaty Concession, the Tacheng uh, Treaty, treaties with Russia. Um, the British removed Bhutan from uh, Chinese rulership. Uh, and the Adaman Islands, which today form a part of India, along with Sikkim, the Pamirs. Nepal is an independent state. Japan took over the uh, Ryukyu Islands, uh, which is where uh, you have Okinawa, the important American naval base. And it's a very important string of islands that essentially holds China uh, at, uh, makes it difficult for China to assert itself into the Pacific because these islands can be uh, defended. Uh, Northern Mongolia, which is now independent, and Mongolia itself. And the list of tributaries are Indochina which comprises four countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand, 1886, uh, Burma, uh, which the British uh, systematically conquered in a series of campaigns and ultimately um, compelled it to stop recognizing Peking uh, for tributary purposes. The 1895 Treaty of Simonoseki, where Japan took over Taiwan, what was then called Formosa. 1895, the detachment of Korea by Japan. 1895, the uh, ending of uh, Malaysian tribute to Peking by the British. Now, Malaysia 
um, that tributary relationship is at a great distance. It was a part of balance of power politics. Malaysia needed China to protect itself from the very, very powerful neighbors. Uh, some of those threats emanated as far as uh, as far as India and as far as the Middle East. It, it, just across from Malaysia is the island of uh, Sumatra with the city of Palembang in the south. But in the north you have Aceh. And Aceh has a large Arab Persian ethnic uh, community, which for some time was uh, seeking independence, Aceh Merdeka. So Malaysia has a long history of having to negotiate with the ties to the north and with the Majapahit Empire or the Srivijayan Empire to the south, which is the old, which is today the Indonesian uh, state. And so they depended on China to provide that security and the British supplanted them. So a lot of these tributary uh, states uh, are, are actually rebuilding on their own this relationship with China. So the, the tributary relationship uh, 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 can bring benefits to these states. And in 1904, uh, Thailand was under similar pressure from the English and the French who agreed as colonial powers uh, to keep Thailand neutral rather than try to occupy it. And this was facilitated by skillful Thai uh, diplomacy. And uh, Thailand today, again, um, is pursuing very close relationships uh, with Beijing because of the, you know, its natural geopolitical situation in Southeast Asia, where it needs uh, Chinese uh, support to counterbalance uh, Vietnam, which is a significantly uh, powerful state. This is the uh, 1954 list of uh, tributary areas and physical real estate that China claimed in 1954. This is the People's Republic of China, the communist uh, government in uh, Beijing that reclaimed these territories. And you can see how far into Southeast Asia uh, it extended and into the Russian Far East. So major Russian cities like Vladivostok and Khabarovsk were before uh, the 1860s and 1850s were entirely under the control of the Qing Dynasty and were never under the control of the Russians. And so there's a significant legitimacy issue there. And you can see, again, the Sino-Indian border, uh, the Kazakh-Chinese uh, border uh, that are also uh, under issue, as well as the island of Sakhalin, uh, which has been rotated between Russia, China, and Japan. And it's valuable because of the energy deposits that are there today. Here you can see the uh, claim from Taiwan, which is very similar, and uh, the administrative and territorial uh, issues uh, that are claimed by the Republic of China. Again, this is the Guomintang government, which shares with the People's Rep Republic of China many of the same claims. This is an important issue because a distinction has to be made between traditional Chinese nationalism the image that the Qing dynasty left, which is a ethnic Manchu regime when it was overthrown in 1911, the communist claims that emanate from the, uh, from the government in Beijing and its manipulation of nationalism, and what China would want if it was democratic. And so it's not immediately apparent what the equilibrium self-identity is for China and what parts of China the population would support a war for. Uh, secessionism and wars of identity are always very important. The First World War demonstrated to European strategists the importance of the principle of self-determination. It is almost arbitrary how people identify or don't identify with a particular polity. And, you know, the liberal tradition is, well, the quality of government uh, should supersede uh, the principles of self-determination. But historically, people prefer to be poor and free than uh, in a society that provides wealth but, but threatens the uh, cancellation of their identity. And so this principle uh, is fluid with regard to China. We actually don't know to what extent China will defend its outlying areas. And the farther you depart from the core center of China, the more uh, um, uh, you end up in the, the uh, frontier areas where there's a significant amount of ethnic admixture, uh, which complicates uh, the issue of identity. Because a lot of the locals will identify uh, with China, and a lot of uh, locals won't.
and a lot of Chinese defer to some extent uh, with local sentiments. Uh, there was, uh, about 20 years ago, before the government clamped down on it, Chinese who were uh, activists, who were uh, indiv individually uh, very supportive of Tibetan nationalism and the idea that, th that the um, Tibetans should have their uh, identity preserved with a very strong autonomy. Uh, so um, these are streams of liberalism that are emerging in the more educated uh, parts of China, and we see parallels like this in Europe and the U.S. So it's it's a natural outgrowth of an affluent population with sort of postmodern um, uh, uh, interests. Here's a, 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 a more colorful representation of the previous slide, and you can see uh, you know, the new polities like Mongolia, for example, or um, uh, Bhutan and Nepal uh, that are no longer uh, part of the tight uh, system of uh, tributary states or territory. North and South Korea were uh, not a part of the Chinese polity, but they were called the Hermit Kingdom precisely because they deferred uh, so much of their foreign policy to uh, China. So this is the core territory of where China began geographically. This is a large plain. It was uh, originally a bamboo forest, uh, which has been overwhelmingly uh, cut down. Uh, it's got the Yellow River running through the center of it, which changes course. It's a flood plain. And so the rivers there uh, flood frequently because there are not a lot of geographic uh, uh, relief that would contain the rivers and compel them to have a consistent course. Understanding China's current strategic perspective depends to a large extent on examining its geography and how the additions to this core of China's area has grown. The Russian plan in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, defined by General uh, Kiropatkin, a, a Russian general, and this is this is a Russian imperial strategy pre-Soviet Union, was to conquer this part of China and nothing nothing south of it, because this core area even today contains almost the majority of the Chinese population. It's a very very densely populated. It's the core of China's origin because it is the most fertile productive agricultural land in China, and because it's a floodplain, it's also under threat from climate change. It depends on the Yellow River, which uh, gets its soil, loessic soil, upstream, which is a kind of powdery yellow soil, but the water itself comes from glacial melting in the Himalayas, uh, and that water source is going to diminish with time, and the rise in sea levels is going to threaten the coast uh, very significantly, as significantly as some of the low-lying areas in Europe. So this is a zoom in on that northern Chinese plain. You can see how the important cities of Beijing to the north and Shanghai to the south are associated with it. Uh, Beijing was established largely in response to the nomadic military threat that has recurrently threatened China. Shanghai in the south is a city uh, largely uh, built out of a village in the 19th century, but in a region where large numbers of Chinese ports have been established over the last 2,000 years because of its facility for export. So cities like Hangzhou, Ningpo have been located there at the mouth of the Yangtze River, the second largest important Chinese river historically. The, the Shanghai is in the traditional region of the Kingdom of Wu, and Mandarin is still spoken there, audibly different than in mainstream China. And even a Westerner can recognize, for example, they will say a s instead of sh, which is uh, uh, the uh, word for is. Now, Xi'an, which you can see on the left here, is the traditional capital of China, also known as Chang'an. Xi'an is located on the Yellow River, which facilitated agriculture, as well as near copper and tin mines, which allowed for the production of bronze. And so the convergence of these three resources 
allowed it to become the most powerful city among cities, and ultimately it would become the first capital of China after the Warring States period. So up to 70% of China's population lives here, although with uh, infrastructure and transportation, the population has moved significantly to the north, north of Beijing, and that's occurred only in the last 150 years, since the end of the 19th century, and to uh, the, the south and the southwest. This is a depiction of China, which shows very interesting relief. And you can see on the right side, the very interesting, very green northern plain of China. This comes from a National Geographic issue uh, during uh, the, the beginning of the Second World War, before the U.S. entered uh, the conflict, uh, showing Japan's conquest of China, and it was meant to illustrate the evacuation of the universities into the interior. So this is a, but uh, uh, it, it is otherwise an excellent representation of why most of the Chinese population lives in the plain, and you can see uh, around um, uh, the Yangtze River, uh, River Plain, which is the river that is essentially uh, just north of China from the east, which is the paragraph on the bottom right side. You can see the Yangtze River going um, uh, inland. And you can see the Pearl River, uh, which is uh, not easy to see, but it's on the extreme left-hand side of the map. It's essentially where you have Hong Kong and uh, Guangzhou. And so these are the three large river systems in China, the Yellow, the Yangtze, and the Pearl River. This is the uh, CIA map of China, and again, you can see the large, dense population in the north, and you can even see the population in the northeast corner, Heilongjian uh, and Jilin uh, provinces, and those populations moved in uh, at the end of the 19th century, around 1875. Before that, it was essentially the native land of the Manchu and they didn't want large numbers of Chinese moving into the area. It was opened up for immigration in response to the opening of the Trans-Siberian Railway into the Russian Far East by Moscow and the flood of uh, Russian immigrants into the region. And so China did it for strategic reasons, or the Manchu uh, essentially did it for uh, strategic reasons. Now, what you can also see in the center is this bowl-shaped red collection of population density, and that's the Sichuan uh, 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 plain. Essentially, you have mountains that form a bowl. It's a very dense environment, and that's where you've got the uh, big cities of Chengdu, and Chongqing, and it used to be one single province. Uh, it was in a, an enormous province with almost 200 million people, but then it was split uh, in two in the 1980s. So if we think of China and its access to the rest of the world, it's partially isolated. You can see on the bottom right a region uh, between Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Chongqing, and Chengdu. This is where most Chinese live. And you can see the mountains of uh, Yunnan in Southeast Asia, into the uh, Himalayas, the, the um, uh, Pamir Mountains in uh, uh, South Asia, and then the, uh, the, the steppe and the, the grasslands and the deserts of uh, the Peklamakan, which is borders Ta uh, Kazakhstan and then Mongolia, and then the taiga. The taiga on the Russian border. Taiga are small pine trees which grow in cold environments and their nettles are very acidic and so it's very difficult to have agriculture there. And, and um, uh, there, you can't get a lot of population density or farming going in most of the Russian Far East because of this, with the exception of the territory that Russia conquered from China in the 1850s and 60s, which is the cities of Khabarovsk and Vladivostok today. But you can see here China's general isolation. Now, one of the theories that, that even though China influenced Japan, Japan's involvement in China is much less than, say, for example, England and Europe, it's because the Japanese agricultural plains are on the far side of their islands. 
And so here you've got the island of Kyushu, Japan, which connects to South Korea, uh, and uh, uh, that doesn't have a very large population, whereas in Europe, London faces Europe, and so it's much more accessible. So there's a lot more population movement in commerce, and therefore a political interaction between England and Europe, where Japan didn't play a role for a very long time, even when there was commerce. Chinese culture is much older than the Chinese state. Chinese writing is thought to originally have been Neolithic and to have been traceable back to pottery manufacture, specifically uh, the signatures of those who formed the pots, as early as 8000 BC. If you were to compare this, for example, with Egyptian hieroglyphics, it's got probably the same age, if not older. Although Egyptian hieroglyphics, like Chinese writing, is still in use today. The, the Copts have transformed hieroglyphics into a, the demotic ecclesiastical writing uh, for their liturgy. Now in China, the Spring Festival, which is the Chinese New Year, uh, dates to about 2600 BC and is thought to involve scaring a monster that was threatening a village. Uh, you know, this, this monster could have been an alligator um, uh, or uh, you know, some sort of feline uh, creature. It, it's difficult to know. Uh, of course, the fireworks associated with it wouldn't have been available until the Tang Dynasty around um, AD 800. Now, while aspects of Chinese culture are very old, its political history compared to Egypt or Mesopotamia or the Indus Valley, uh, those stretch back uh, 1000 uh, to 1500 to 2500 to 4000 years um, uh, before Christ, China's history is not so ancient. Chinese society developed late compared with the Near East. Consequently, there are few ancient structures in China comparable to, say, Catalhuyuk. Uh, or Stonehenge, or uh, even classical Greece. Beautiful but rare to find structures uh, that exist before AD 100 are, are not common. Clan-based farming villages with a short transition from hunting, given the role of both ancestor worship and uh, human sacrifice, uh, and this is a very common uh, practice among societies that did an early transition from hunting to warfare. Human sacrifice is based on the notion of animal sacrifice, and animal sacrifice is a part of a very common practice among humans to ask for uh, forgiveness from animals uh, that they've hunted. Uh, an example of this is Idi Amin, the ruler of Uganda. He was uh, commonly called a cannibal because uh, as soldiers, when they killed an enemy, they would stab them with a knife and then lick the blood and ask for forgiveness so that their spirit would not haunt them. This is very, very common. Uh, for hunting societies, and it, it's, it's, it's a function of, of devotion, uh, not of, of domination or uh, cruelty. And when institutionalized, uh, this sacrifice from animals to humans is carried over into the political sphere because the political leader is then showing the same devotion on behalf of the state in order to get uh, things like uh, rain in order for the village to get the water that it needs. So what are the origins of China's sense of political legitimacy? Now these, these actually have their origin in the primordial, what are termed dynasties, of the Zia, uh, which uh, started as early as 2200 uh, BC to 1700, uh, the Shang, um, and the Zhou. Now these are not dynasties in the sense of contiguous royal families with a central political culture, but they're described as such by uh, Chinese historiography because later Chinese emperors use these to justify the legitimacy of their current regimes as a contiguous representation of these earlier political forms. These are really cultures. You had multiple polities uh, of many different types. Uh, China had a great deal of diversity in its different type of polities, particularly um, after the Zhou culture and more recently the Warring States period. Uh, so the idea that China had a single political form is not true. You did not have homogenous states. Some were more religious, some were more barbaric, some were more agricultural, some were more horse-based, uh, some were more bureaucratic, some were more feudal. A great variety of polities associated with a great variety of 
uh, uh, political philosophies that we'll see later on. China was actually uh, uh, like we, we think of the civilizations that emerged around the Mediterranean in Europe and the Near East and North Africa, a place of great cultural diversity. So these different cultures were ba built on each other. Sometimes they had city-states as the political center. Sometimes these uh, uh, transformed into territorial kingdoms. So the Shang period had alternating hierarchies as states succeeded each other, and, and we, we have identified many of these states, um, like An Yang, for example, or Zhang Zhou. Uh, there was a significant amount of slavery in the Shang culture, and this typically happens when you've got a lot of conquest. You conquer peasants from another society and then bring them in to work on your own land. So this indicates that there was not a lot of political uh, uh, stability. Uh, during the Zhou period, you had um, significant barbarian slave revolts. In other words, revolts by people that the Chinese identified as non-Han. Han is the identity that comes from these early cultures about who, who the Chinese thought they were, as opposed to people outside of their territory, even if those people were, in a sense, genetically similar or visibly similar, they were not people of the Han if they're ethnically uh, ethnically similar but culturally different. Now this this uh, culture uh, under the Zhou slowly transformed into a feudal system. And a feudal system is you've got a monarch with an army and they're not able to rule their entire kingdom and so they grant direct managerial control of territory to other nobles, very often members of their family, and those nobles give military service and they could give tribute in the sense of goods. Uh, in, in the form of uh, agricultural goods, mined goods, or uh, timber, or horses. And this is a natural outcropping when you've got a natural solution of governance when you've got a transportation issue and a central regime is not able to assert itself efficiently over and, and uh, coherently across uh, a great stretch of geography. Now all of this is possible because of the common outgrowth of commerce. In the large plain of northern China, transportation was relatively easier than other parts of the world where you had mountains and valleys that obstructed communications. And so you had a competition of ideas which ultimately resulted in, in the settling on a common language, a common culture, and a shared writing script. Not imposed, but emerged through a process of cultural natural selection. And this emerged from the Low River Valley, which if you could uh, reduce a, a, an origin locus for Chinese culture based upon archaeological evidence, it would be uh, that river system that I'll show you in a moment. Now this river system, uh, similar to the capital of Xi'an that I mentioned earlier, coincided with the availability of copper and tin, which made for the possibility of bronze, which is a, which is a very strong form of metal and superior in many ways to stone and bone because it can be resharpened. And this is, it's important not only for weapons and armor, but also for agriculture. Uh, because it allows for easier plowing of fields, as well as access in the Lower River Valley to a water source that allowed for irrigation, that allowed for the cultivation of food. So China in its early Zia and Shang culture probably numbered only two million people. And it was during the Zhou culture that you had an explosion in the population up to 20 million, uh, which essentially coincided with the end of slavery. Because now you had political systems that governed over people, and when they conquered other territories, rather than deporting the population, they simply adopted, um, uh, adopted them into their own uh, polity. And associated with this is uh, ancestral worship rites. Again, this is very common. The Romans engaged in many of the similar uh, activities, so it's, it's not unique to China. What is unique to China is the preservation of ancestor worship uh, to today, which in Europe was supplanted by uh, Middle Eastern uh, traditions of monotheism. Now, the cultural component of this society converged on uh, ancestor worship that came out of clan traditions. 
And one of these is the value of filial piety, which in Chinese terms is uh, termed li. Essentially, obe obedience to one's parents and the responsibility of having to take care of one's parents. And this is the cornerstone of family values and cultural values in traditional China that contributes to the hierarchy. Now, obedience to elders is fairly common in most traditions where you don't have a significant opportunity to emigrate. Uh, in Europe, by contrast, you had a tradition of emigration where the youngest child would stay behind uh, in uh, Central European cultures and all of the older children would leave and clear forests and open up new agricultural land. So uh, in, in pre-feudal Europe and post-feudal Europe, you had a significant amount of movement. So law in China emanated from the sovereign and their associated bureaucracy. Uh, now bureaucracy we'll talk about later on, but it initially started out as simply the the uh, chamberlain in the palace who uh, administered the taxation or the collection of goods from the uh, monarchy or, or on behalf of the monarchy. And this tradition uh, uh, didn't come from religion, although the Chinese monarchs did have religious responsibilities of interceding on behalf of the higher uh, uh, gods that helped control nature and provide uh, water, but it was primarily um, uh, politically based. So there's no there's no ecclesiastical class as you'd see in uh, Egypt, which is very very powerful, or a legal profession, which you'd see, for example, uh, in Rome, you know, the praetors and the quaestors and the aediles that would uh, run the state. Uh, you can see here a chariot, which is the typical. A weapon of war that pretty much spread from the Near East and what is today uh, Ukraine to the entire planet within a single century. So the technology of the chariot uh, was actually shared by most of the polities. And this shows that there was a form of communications uh, facilitated by uh, transportation along the steppes of Eurasia, but it didn't necessarily carry ideas. There's a very, you know, you, you simply needed one example of a chariot, which is a very efficient form of transportation, because here, once you knew how to build a wheel with spokes, um, uh, most of the weight of the wagon uh, could be invested in the actual transportation uh, uh, box that would be pulled by the horses, and it could then be used for military purposes. And against masses of quickly raised peasants, um, an archery attack or a charge by a chariot was an efficient way of breaking up that kind of military formation. So China, like uh, Egypt, uh, made use of chariots at this time. Here is the Low River Valley, which again, it's on the Yellow uh, River. And if we could identify the source of China's culture, the Han culture, it is here. And it's associated with uh, Luoyang, um, uh, the city of Luoyang, and it's of course also the location of uh, Xi'an, uh, which is uh, the capital of China for several different dynasties. And again, here you've got access to rivers, uh, which is important for irrigation and food supply, as well as uh, copper and tin for bronze production. So here you see the Shang civilization in the plain. Uh, and you can see other cultures that are genetically related uh, to the Chinese in the north. And uh, you can see the Wu people to the south of what is today Shanghai. And so they are a different people, even if many of the people in Shanghai no longer recognize uh, their origins. Although it should be pointed out that in my trips to uh, Shanghai, um, the vast majority of the people in Shanghai are immigrants and the Wu peoples are uh, really only um, present in the rural areas. And even then you've had significant uh, migration uh, between uh, the provinces over the centuries. And so the population is diluted, but you can still see uh, the tombs of the monarchs of the uh, kingdom of Wu, although they're not popular Western uh, tourist destinations because the Chinese don't think that Westerners uh, would be uh, interested. So this is not a very good map, but it does show uh, Zhengzhou in the center. And it shows Luoyang um, a few 
increments down the uh, road uh, towards the uh, left side of the map. So you can see Luoyang, so that would be the uh, beginning of uh, the core geographic area for China. And you can also see uh, Anyang. So if you go to Zhengzhou, which is in the center of the map, and you follow the road north just before the map ends, you'll see Anyang in the north. And these are the three most important cities in China during this very early period. It was Erlatou, the uh, city uh, or palace in Luo, uh, near Luoyang, uh, that is the basis for all Chinese palace designs today. And so if, if we're looking for the initial model that was copied for the Forbidden City in Beijing, and is the model for many of the elite homes as to what a palace is supposed to look like, there's actually a path-dependent architectural replication of this one uh, design, which was discovered archaeologically and uh, dated as very early. This is a super complicated map of uh, me sitting down and going through historical uh, texts to try to figure out what the archaeological origin was. And of course, there is none. Uh, but it shows you that it, it's this general region. You can see the Low River, which is the, the, the Yellow River um, uh, in, in the middle, designated by the Blue Line. And the Low River is a uh, tributary which comes in from the south uh, west and goes into the Yellow River. Um, and so it, that it's along the low river, Luoyang, that you get the first uh, origins of Chinese culture, and it, it goes by, by uh, Zhengzhou. And you know you can read the notes around the edges here, but essentially it's looking at uh, access to technology and the geography creating certain technology and the archaeological evidence dating populations uh, in the area. And um, there's a, a significant concentration of the very oldest. Um, artifacts from early Chinese culture in this particular region. Uh, and of course, consequently, because of the millennia that have passed, there's a, a, a huge density of cultures that are built on top of each other. China's available technology in the centuries before Christ was predominantly late Neolithic. In other words, late stone technology. Uh, China was quite primitive compared to Egypt, for example, or the Indus civilization uh, in what is today Pakistan. Farmers used stone tools for farming, for plowing. There were villages in China by around 6000 BC. Uh, there was widespread use of bone armor and bronze weapons. Uh, which gave a decisive advantage to those polities that knew how to mine the technology or construct the bone armor. Iron use only began around 475 BC, which is very, very late by comparison uh, to the Near East, uh, where uh, when you're looking at the Assyrians, uh, they had an army that was almost entirely equipped with iron weapons, which gave them a huge advantage over bronze. Iron uh, doesn't blunt as easily, doesn't bend, and uh, quite efficiently smashes its way through bronze armor. Only by 100 BC, this is after the establishment of China's first empire, did it catch up to the Roman Empire in technology. However, in the following thousand years, you know, by 800 AD during the Tang Dynasty, China would become the most commercially active, meaning it, it exported goods all over the world, and technologically advanced state in the world. Uh, the Tang Dynasty, uh, a, a ethnically Han dynasty, uh, endured from 8618 to 907. And so for these three centuries, China was far and away the most technologically advanced state in the world. Uh, it had uh, uh, um, discovered and manufactured for shipping the magnetic compass. Uh, of course, uh, uh, China discovered uh, the explosive power of uh, black uh, powder uh, used for fireworks and weaponry and uh, printing and paper, as well as advanced forms of uh, smelting and pottery constructions. 
and uh, uh, various forms of coal-based early industrialization that wasn't uh, didn't achieve the level of mechanization that Europe had in the 18th and 19th century, but got pretty close. In fact, uh, there's a lot of literature expended questioning why China's Tang Dynasty did not leap into industrialization as far back as the 9th and 10th centuries. One of the large mysteries. And uh, the conventional wisdom is that the uh, combination of a commercial middle class uh, with uh, protection from uh, a domination by a bureaucratic regime that preferred stability, social stability over technological advancement, and the lack of incentives of a foreign threat which occurred in Europe basically uh, disincentivized the widespread uh, uh, application and exploration of technology, even though China had the leading doctors the leading technologists, the leading uh, mechanical engineers and civil engineers in the world at the time. Uh, probably um, uh, only in competition with the uh, Islamic um, uh, world and its uh, academies in places like what is today Syria and Iraq. So here you can see uh, slaves from the uh, uh, Shang dynasty and associated with the Zhou dynasty and you can see uh, typical uh, Chinese villages, which are um, no different than that type of agriculture anywhere else in the world at this level of technology. I met a physician from Zhengzhou, which is a city in the Chinese plain that I showed earlier on the map. These are the walls of Zhengzhou, and they're uh, only in existence on the southern section of the city. They were actually built between 1500 to 1200 years BC, largely by pounding earth. The rest of the city's walls, of course, have been removed um, as a, the population grew, but this part of the city has been preserved, and people frequently walk their dogs here for exercise. Uh, this physician didn't know that these walls existed, although uh, he traveled through them. Uh, here you can see a road was plowed through uh, in order to facilitate public transportation uh, through the city. So this is one of the oldest cities in China and is a part of the complex of important cities during the Xia and the Shang and the Zhou period. And so you had cities that were uh, uh, in competition in terms of technology with the cities that you had in the Near East, although they're, they occurred a thousand or two thousand years later. So this is one depiction of the wall of Zhengzhou. Here's another depiction of the wall of Zhengzhou. So Hanbei City, which is uh, to the north of Zhengzhou, near Anyang in Henan province, is, it's again, it's a city I showed you earlier on the map that's north of Zhengzhou. That was about the largest city in China at the time, and it had a population of around 10,000 people, which implies a much larger rural population on the outside of the city, connected by rivers and roads uh, to provide agriculture to sustain that city. And that was about a 1300 years uh, BC, uh, which puts it, if in comparison to the Near East in Europe, around the time of uh, uh, the pre-Bronze Age collapse, when most uh, of European cities collapsed, except for those, except for some of the cities in Egypt, in response to a combination of ecological disaster, a food shortage, uh, deurbanization, a loss of technology, and then mass piracy and invasion, uh, and then you had a reemergence of culture. Uh, China might have been affected by the Bronze Age collapse because you didn't have a large increase in population in China until after the Bronze Age collapse. So that environmental event that occurred in Europe and also occurred in the Indus Valley of Pakistan, largely ending that urban civilization, uh, might actually have been a global phenomenon. But again, not much has been recorded. Only the Egyptians recorded the event because they were the only ones, at least in the Mediterranean basin, uh, to survive. Now, one of the interesting insights we have on the culture comes from An Yang. Uh, which is from the period of the walls here in Zhengzhou. And these are the oracle bones. So here we have an oracle bone. This is actually a 
turtle shell. And on the inside, the Chinese would uh, inscribe writing and they would then, uh, it would then be placed in the fire, and this would be a form of augury, a form of predicting the future, a religious activity to somehow uh, uh, deal with daily concerns like health and wealth and success, and this would tell people about the future. Now, these were discovered by European archaeologists in the 19th century because the Chinese had for centuries dug these up, crushed them, put them as an ingredient in drinks of traditional Chinese medicine to deal with a number of ailments. But once these were dated, the archaeologists discovered that these were an incredible insight into the origins of Chinese language because the characters used today uh, to represent uh, Chinese language, Mandarin, had their origins and could be uh, traced uh, philologically back to these early characters, which were, as ideographs, much closer representations of the original uh, objects they were trying to depict, like you know, sun, mountains, uh, or, or cattle. Now, uh, uh, these were dated to about 1300 uh, BC, which is, again, the time of the walls around Zhengzhou, um, and many of these were located uh, in Anyang, um, uh, specifically at Hanbei City in Henan, which is, which is the modern equivalent, and Anyang is the original uh, ruins of the uh, earlier city. Now, this is not super ancient again compared to the uh, Near East. The Egyptians had their first pyramid at Saqqara, um, sort of mastabas built on top of each other by 2700 BC. So Egyptian civilization is much older. Uh, but uh, what we have with, with these oracle bones is contiguity in culture, uh, which allows us to read what common uh, um, people of the hand were thinking about um, so many thousands of years ago. So the preservation of language in this written form is, uh, you know, has provided through luck a fascinating insight uh, into the earlier culture. Now, again, it's thought that these original ideographs started off uh, in their earliest form as potter's names to identify the origin of the production of pots. Um, and then the oracle bones, you know, the Chinese people forgot what their purpose was as their culture evolved. And Chinese, Chinese culture has evolved. It's not, it's not been constant throughout history. Uh, these oracle bones were forgotten about and then dug up and uh, they were used in medicine. But it's thought the original purpose was to uh, have augury where you would appeal uh, to your ancestors to find out from their presence in the netherworld, where they've you know, died and gone off, if they could give insight to the living about what was going to happen uh, in the, the present or the future. Now this is Erlato. This is the original model in the Luoyang Valley for what China's ultimately palaces would look like. And the Forbidden City is a significant elaboration of this initial form. It looks basically like a hut or like a bungalow uh, surrounded by a outer wall uh, with a, a, a columns holding up a roof and a single entrance. And uh, this was a palace for a, uh, a, a basically a local monarch, a local chieftain, who uh, became the center for taxation. And so this facility would have to accumulate and hold the tribute from the um, neighboring uh, communities and for the agricultural goods uh, provided by the peasants of the villages that would obey this particular uh, chieftain. And so, um, this is the uh, 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 standard model for all of the subsequent palaces in China. This is where the initial form uh, began. Now, it's not like Karnak in Egypt, which is a large stone uh, temple complex. There was not as much accessible stone in China in the flat plain. Now, around Xi'an, uh, there was, but the, 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 the Chinese were not at the same level of uh, stone technology as the Egyptians uh, or uh, 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 the, the individuals, the Minoans who lived in uh, Crete. 
so it, it is like uh, Knossos in the sense that it's a, a palace with um, space for warehousing and storage of agricultural goods that could then be redistributed or could uh, be used as a surplus to feed a population, a non-agricultural population that would be serving the needs of that community. Now, this particular polity uh, during the Shang period had an army, a permanent standing organization of soldiers of a thousand men. And this is, this, this is remarkable because it, it meant that you had to have the surplus in the crafts men and women who would make the weapons and the armor, uh, provide the horses, and uh, would provide the food so that these soldiers um, wouldn't have to be levied uh, from the peasantry. And the chief would, would then use these soldiers to protect uh, the territory to sustain the, the continuous uh, payment of tribute and taxes. And this would, of course, evolve into the much uh, larger uh, polities. Now, uh, this ultimately would become uh, uh, the, the core of the cities like Zhangzhou, like Anyang, uh, like Luoyang. And uh, these cities would, of course, dominate their uh, outside agricultural lands. And during these three cultural periods of the Jia, uh, Shang, and Zhou, uh, you would have these actual polities conflicting with each other um, uh, during these cultural uh, periods. So here you can see uh, Erlato, which is uh, in its uh, present um, uh, reconstruction. Um, there is uh, cities that have been archaeologically dug up, uh, that have been analyzed by Chinese archaeologists, and because of the inconvenience of where they're located on scarce agricultural land, they've been reburied under protection. This is very common. The same occurs in England and parts of Italy, uh, which is you know the typical compromise you make between fascinating uh, uh, archaeological work, but uh, very important uh, real-world uh, economic uh, requirements. And China takes these uh, efforts as seriously as many of the uh, European states. So this is the Warring States period of China. And this is uh, after an earlier period, which are named after poems that uh, came with the uh, essentially the evolution out of the uh, Zhou period. So the Warring States period doesn't actually extend from 770 BC to 256. It's, it's really named for the latter period. But what characterizes this period is you have multiple different states. And so you have a balance of power dynamic where these states are fighting each other in the large plain. You already had walls that protected some of these states against the threats of nomadic peoples from the plains uh, to the north. But these states were not homogenous in their governance, even if they were homogenous to some extent over language uh, and culture. Uh, and when I mean culture, I mean linguistic culture. So they could communicate with each other. So there's a lot of exchange of ideas. This period is also fascinating because it created many different foundational philosophies of China that were not necessarily compatible that we'll look at later on. And in many ways, uh, you had a lot of philosophies like Moha. He anticipated a loving, uh, a philosophy of uh, people loving each other in, in the way that Christianity elaborated out of um, the Nazarenes of Judaism. So uh, uh, China was um, more diverse and in fact uh, came across um, uh, many of the philosophies we have today before uh, Europe or the Near East did. And this is important. Um, it was a wellspring of many, many important ideas during this uh, early period. Now, the basis for Chinese legitimacy was built upon previous regimes. When you had a internal conflict and the strongest warrior or warlord took over, in order to govern, they needed the deference of the population. They didn't have the power to attack the entire population. So they would buy into pre-existing models of governance and then associate themselves with it. They would, of course, um, uh, uh, write some texts or use past texts to justify their existence. They would very often destroy 
earlier texts uh, that showed them in a long uh, in a, in, the, in in a bad light. But essentially, the uh, the the core effort was not to remake the entire system through force, but to fit into uh, a gradual evolution of previous forms of governance. So here you can see King Wu of Zhou, and you can see the first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi. Now this is important because the Zhou dynasty was really the first uh, uh, imperial state, not uh, Qin Shi Huangdi. Qin Shi Huangdi declared himself uh, emperor, but based his legitimacy on the Zhou's that came before him. Now the Zhou dynasty, um, at the latter end, there was a dynasty, but it was feudal. You had uh, princes that ruled uh, uh, in China, but they received tribute from the other states. And even during the Warring States period, when the Zhou had lost almost all military power, there was still a deference to them, not because Zhou was a threat, but because the inhabitants of the other Chinese states would only recognize the leader if the, the, the leader if the leader recognized the Zhou. So the principle of legitimacy is very important for China. Um, the principle of legitimacy compensates for the cost of transportation. And because China had this cultural homogeneity enabled by language and uh, the uh, gradual spread of the language through this plane, it was easier to use previous governance forms than to come up with new ones. Now Wen and Wu of Zhou uh, overthrew the last Shang uh, emperor, Zhou Xin, in 111, uh, 1111 to 1066 BC. Under the legitimacy of restoring the moral order of what they appeal to of the Jia dynasty. So they're hearkening back to a previous political system. And so it's the Zhou princes who came up with the concept of the mandate of heaven. The idea that the gods would support the secular leader through violence that would establish order. And the proof that the peasants didn't revolt showed that those leaders had the support of the gods. And stability for the peasants was very important because economic activity, living, uh, being able to benefit from, from agriculture and um, use of the irrigation systems from the rivers depended on stability. So the mandate of heaven wasn't manufactured suddenly it was really a reference back to a previous age, and that previous age might have been um, uh, not historically accurate, but built upon the uh, rather shallow, commonsensical, popular memory um, of, of what people thought was uh, the earlier, um, very often mythologically uh, reproduced idea of what came earlier. So in the mandate of heaven, a ruler can claim legitimacy only so long as their rule is just. And of course, the measure is that, that you don't have instability, at least to the overthrow of the dynasty. And so dynasties in the past that were overthrown um, were seen as, you could justify them as illegitimate, and you could justify your participation in overthrowing it uh, precisely because the gods didn't support it. It's a bit of a tautology. Uh, but without, without the tautology of being able to replace an overthrown uh, society, um, no leader would have been able to establish themselves. And of course, um, uh, the vast majority of the population were seeking stability, which is the purpose of these, um, these emperors. So even during the Warring States period, which went from 770 to 256 BC, there remained the legitimacy of a unified China around the Zhou. Now the Zhou were originally 300 years before that, 1027 to 771 BC, and they were seen as a symbolic legitimate center. But again, because they were feudal, they didn't rule China in a centralized manner through a bureaucracy. They relied on tribute from other monarchies that had been defeated in battle to send tribute. So they were a center. They were a source of legitimacy, uh, but they were not ruling China as a homogenous system. The Zhou were not Chinese, and they were um, they remembered their pre-farming history uh, in their literature. So they were, you know, sort of um, a village uh, society, and they remembered um, uh, aspects of migration and hunting. The Zhou clan survived actually into the Warring States period. 
And the Warring States period coincides with the emergence of iron. Uh, in China, in the Flat Plain. And iron's big impact is it's much more efficient, both in terms of weaponry and armor, but again, for agriculture, as a, uh, both for construction and for plows. The deeper you plow, the, the more land can be turned over in an amount of time, uh, given the availability of humans or animals uh, to pull the plow, the greater the agricultural wealth, the greater, therefore, the population, the greater the level of urbanization, which allows for specialization, the creation of states and specialization, which then leads on to uh, political uh, philosophy. So Qin Shi Huangdi, China's first emperor who created the Qin dynasty, he actually had a hybrid system. He relied on the feudalism of the Zhou dynasty that came before. He standardized the written language by having a standard form of characters. He standardized the monetary system as well as weights and measures. He standardized to some extent the legal system and he relied on moralism as a straight a state uh, uh, written philosophy which was then distributed to those that are supposed to follow. His innovation was to begin the process of creating a bureaucracy to supplant the feudal reliance on local lords. So lords were dispossessed of their land. Historical genealogical association with territory based on the past were was partially, not fully, but partially replaced by rotated government officials who were uh, uh, ruling and uh, we're not really ruling, but governing, rather, administratively on behalf of uh, Qin Shi Huangdi. But this process was incomplete. There were still many feudal elements within Qin Shi Huangdi's um, uh, system. The dark green square in the Chinese plain that you can see, uh, you can see the cities in there, Yan, Shang'an, and Luoyang, uh, this is the core of Qin Shi Huangdi's kingdom, China's first empire. This was the end result of a large conflict during the Warring States period in which the Qin, which was a kingdom on the extreme west of this plain, uh, which was not entirely civilized, the other states recognized it as a state where Chinese influence was penetrating, but not fully penetrating. And these people were less agricultural, but they were supported because they created a barrier against even less settled and more violent populations that were coming in from the plains. And so it was basically a buffer state. But this militarized buffer state essentially pivoted and started engaging in war with its more mobile military force, and it somehow puzzlingly overcame the centrifugal forces of the balance of power and conquered all of the other states in a series of conflicts. This is one of the big mysteries in Chinese uh, history, which is why China could be unified and other regions of the world like South Asia, the Near East and Europe were not. Of course, there are exceptions because the Romans uh, did unify the territory around the Mediterranean for a brief period. And a lot of South Asia occasionally was able to unify except for the Chola kingdom uh, in the south and what is today uh, Ceylon or Sri Lanka. So this is the region that, uh, that encompassed the Qin dynasty within the northern Chinese plain. Obviously because of the geography facilitated the movement along the Yellow River that you can see in the north, the Huanghe, and the Yangtze River, uh, which you can see in the south, which is the old kingdom of Wu. Now, Qin Shi Huangdi uh, ruled only from 221 to 210 uh, BC. Uh, contemporarily in Europe at this time, Rome was barely ruling um, uh, the entire Italian boot. So China achieved uh, its, its imperium uh, two centuries, uh, about a century and a half before Rome did. Now this was a short-lived and unconsolidated imperium in China because the, the administrative reforms by Qin Shi Huangdi were not profound enough to unify the region. There was a bureaucracy there were attempts to standardize weights and language and laws, but they interacted with the centrifugal forces of 
feudalism. So it was really a quasi-feudal empire with a single written language, uh, a variation of legal systems, weights and measures and currency. You did have a, an attempt at a uniform state structure. Its basis was legalism, which is a, a, a very, it's, it's not so much a political philosophy as a practice of having a list of laws and punishments for breaking those laws with an emphasis on stability. And that legalism persists to this day in China. And it occurs in competition with and as a complement to other Chinese philosophies like uh, Confucianism, uh, Taoism, or the, the mysticism of uh, Buddhism and Mohism. So there, there's many traditions, but legalism has always been associated with the core of the Chinese state, starting with Qin Shi Huangdi. Now, a lot of the, the the cultural, early cultural traditions that we associate with Qin Shi Huangdi um, uh, are, are, you know, persist in its interaction with the West. China is called China because Qin Shi Huangdi's empire was proximately located to remnants of Alexander the Great's Greek colonies in places like Central Asia and Kashmir. And one of those, one of the examples of the Greek cultural influence in uh, human sculptures uh, was, of course, the uh, warriors uh, in Xi'an, which are these terracotta uh, uh, constructions of soldiers meant to preserve a Qin Shi Huangdi in the afterlife. So you see a, a cultural um, form that's very similar to the Egyptians, where you build large uh, public works in order to protect the leader in the afterlife. And there's a great deal of interest in magic that would enable people to achieve uh, immortality uh, and to continue to intercede on behalf of the people. Very, very similar to what you see in Egypt. Um, but post Qin Shi Huangdi, uh, and of course, if you go to Xi'an, you can see Qin Shi Huangdi's tomb, which has never been dug up. But we have accounts of what's inside the tomb, which is rivers of mercury. So we can imagine it's um, you know beautiful on the scale of what the Egyptians manufactured. But of course, uh, 2,500 years later, the Egyptians also abandoned very large public works. Uh, about 1,500 years um, uh, before uh, China abandoned this form. Um, uh, dynasties after Qin Shi Huangdi no longer uh, engaged in these enormous public works designed uh, for the immortality of the leader. They basically did what Egypt did and they built uh, tombs. So um, uh, China, uh, because of the Greek contact, um, was essentially the name adopted by Westerners for China. Now, Chinese call uh, China Zhongguo, which is Middle Kingdom. So they focus on the administrative aspect. The ethnic identity is Han Chinese, but uh, Zhongguo could incorporate people who were not Han. And uh, to this day, in core provinces like Hunan, uh, you have people, Tejia people, or uh, what are also called Hakka people, who are genetically Vietnamese. And while they have a distinct identity, it's only recently discovered that they were uh, remnants of the Vietnamese people that were pushed south by the expansion of the Chinese people. So China um, uh, didn't homogenize all of the cultures, but uh, uh, many of these cultures preserved their distinct identity, but nevertheless adopted the language, the, 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 uh, the rights, um, uh, and the other cultural forms of the Chinese and were incorporated into this non-ethnic state, although this, this ethnic state does have a, a, a core Han uh, origin. So the Greeks called China Qin after uh, this initial state that uh, Qin Shi Huangdi led before he conquered uh, the, um, the entire Chinese plain. Uh, the Romans uh, continued to, care, to, to call it Qin. Um, Marcus Aurelius, um, well, during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor um, sent a, uh, didn't send, but rather there was a, um, a merchant group that visited uh, China in AD uh, 166. Just This is during the Han Dynasty, long after the Qin Dynasty. The Chinese called him Antun King, like Antun, like, like Anthony. Um, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the Romans... Uh, 
use the term for China that we uh, basically continue to use uh, in the West today, even though it's not how the Chinese describe uh, their own state. Now, Qin Shi Huangdi's state did not last. It basically extended to his son, and then there was a revolt, largely because of the failure to consolidate the state system. So we have the puzzle of China's centralization compared with other polities. The peculiar observation that China is more centralized than either South Asia on its own or Europe or the Middle East. Most of the regions in the world tend to be politically divided along geographic lines. And looking at Europe, for example, you have states that are approximately the size physically and with the populations of provinces in China. And in Europe, you have a much greater diversity of language uh, and of writing systems and of religions, where China's far more unified. And you know, China seems to stand out compared to other geographic regions of the world in terms of its diversity. You look at India, there are seven different kinds of alphabets, even if most of the population follows one religion, uh, which is Hinduism. So there are a number of explanations, and the first of three explanations for the puzzle of China centralization is Karl Wittfogel's hydraulic society theory. Now, this argues that societies whose agriculture is organized around irrigation from rivers tend to develop centralized administrations to address three responsibilities. Number one, the repair of irrigation canals to distribute water and protect against flooding from breaches in that canal system. Two, managing of seasonal water droughts and floods. Sometimes you get a lot of water. Sometimes you don't get enough water. So you need reserve reservoirs across multiple seasons to deal with periods when there is drought. And you need to be able to channel the water away so it doesn't lead to destruction when you've got too much water. And finally, to organize the mobilization of labor on an enormous scale in order to keep these uh, uh, irrigation systems functioning. And this is a, a, a theory that's applied commonly to explain the political organization of Mesopotamia in uh, what is today Pakistan, the old Indus River uh, civilization. Because even though the Indus River civilization uh, largely collapsed, Pakistan today has the longest continuous large-scale irrigation system in the world. And this requires a certain amount of persistent political organization because even only 20 years of political chaos can lead to the complete destruction of an irrigation system, the collapse of agriculture, and uh, the de-urbanization of the civilized, uh, meaning uh, a city-dwelling literate populations that uh, grow from it. So Karl Wittfogel argues that China, because it gets its water from rivers, and not from uh, plentiful rain like Europe, which basically falls from the sky, and therefore you need less political organization. And you don't have a huge portion of the water coming from a very predictable monsoon. Uh, uh, China's focus is on ensuring that water from the rivers is managed and contained. Here you can see the Northern Chinese Plain. And what you can see are the different river courses of the Huanghe, the Yellow River, across the different dynasties. So you would have very large scale floods emanating from exogenous ecological factors, probably due with temperature and the melting or the non-melting of rivers uh, and their glaciers in the Himalayas. And when you'd have a great deal of flooding in a very flat piece of land, rivers would gouge out new courses. And so here you've got the Shandong Peninsula, which is the peninsula that uh, basically juts out uh, into um, the Chinese coast off uh, to the uh, east. And the river would sometimes flow to the north and sometimes uh, flow to the south. And you can even see on the top part of the map the uh, coast changing as loisic soil, which is its yellow powdery soil uh, from the western part of China, is carried down by the river and deposited uh, in the alluvial plain. And so even the coast is changing. 
uh, uh, these changes of, of course, courses by the river, uh, lead to tremendous destruction of the society because it's a very, very flat land. And while it's agriculturally uh, very, very rich, you don't have the um, geographic relief that protects you against these uh, rivers causing enormous damage. If you were to compare the, uh, the erratic change of course in rivers like the Nile, like the Danube or the Rhine in Europe, you're going to get much less variation in uh, dramatic changes, of course. You do have uh, 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 river changes in, in, the, in Iraq with the Tigris and the Euphrates and of the Indus and the Punjab in uh, Pakistan. There you have dramatic changes and uh, consequently a similar uh, political form. Here you can see Chinese working on a dike around the Yellow River. And this is an actual contemporary depiction of work. This is the modern equivalent of irrigation control. The Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River that was completed uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. And it is an enormous effort to deal with the very erratic uh, flooding of the Yangtze River um, uh, uh, in China's history. In 1938, to delay the advance of the Japanese invasion of China, which began in 1937, the Guomintang, which was uh, the principal government of China, there were many warlords and the communists uh, were in control uh, in the north, in Shaanxi, the Guomintang uh, deliberately broke the dikes on the Yellow River. Uh, and these, these embankments opened up, even, even a small hole will lead to a massive amount of flooding. It did effectively slow down the advance of the Japanese and it led to an enormous loss of life in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and the minimum numbers are half a million uh, Chinese killed, typically uh, through a drowning, um, starvation because agriculture is destroyed, uh, and then the spread of disease and um, uh, all the problems associated with the destruction of infrastructure. The second explanation for the puzzle of China's political centralization and the culture that supports it is that Chinese political systems were already centralized before the initiation of large scale irrigation projects. So before we're looking at Qin Shi Huangdi's state and its reliance on the Huanghao and the Yangtze River and essentially centralized demands on labor. Even before then, you had, you had strong Chinese administrative structures. There, the explanation is much more conventional and in line with European explanations. And this comes from the political sociologist Charles Tilley, who said about Europe that states created war and war created the state. In other words, states were pressured through, through the military threats from their neighbors to organize. So they created standing armies and the technology to support the armies and the support staffs to manufacture the weapons. To do this, they needed a surplus. To have a surplus, they needed to have effective taxation. In other words, uh, being able to hire scribes that were literate that could record the possessions of the state and then to tax the individuals and what they were um, uh, growing in the fields. And so you have a competition within this northern state and the weaker states that didn't master, through a process of natural selection, this regime skill were eliminated in the great competition of the warring states period. And so you end up with these very, very large states that were all very efficient um, in this competition. Now, the same organization that manufactures weapons and collects taxes would, of course, use those same skills to protect the source of taxation or, or the source of the wealth of taxation, which is the agricultural fields, by uh, contributing um, to the mobilization of workers to maintain the dikes of not only the Yellow and the Yangtze, but of all the smaller minor uh, tributaries in the flat Chinese plain. Uh, you can see a tax document in the center. You can see uh, Chinese coinage. Um, uh, now, Chinese coinage is, is not newer 
than uh, coinage in the West. The first coins uh, were about 600 BC in the city of Sardis in the state of Lydia in uh, Asia Minor. Uh, but uh, China you know, very quickly adopted a system that was efficient, which is uh, a bronze coinage, which allowed for you know, sort of portable representation of wealth. And you can see the type of uh, administration in the top extreme right uh, corner, which uh, you know, shows the type of administration, how the Chinese saw the administration, which is government officials at offices who are fully literate and numerate recording um, the various uh, applications of, of, of state strategy to keep control of its tax base. Now China again did not start off with a bureaucracy. It went through a sequence of evolutions beginning with uh, slavery and the uh, a picture on the top left shows uh, um, uh, individuals uh, in, in a slave society. Uh, what precisely is being depicted is not uh, clear. That could be a slave owner. But this is common in warfare where peasants were captured and then displaced to work on the land of another lord. Obviously, um, there was a significant uh, loss of life in slavery, but the incentive was for the slave owners to have uh, a, a level of, of quality of life so that these slaves could keep working on the land. This is not, a, not an uncommon form. Uh, in Europe, uh, slavery lasted much longer, uh, 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 at least half a millennium longer as a system. Um, until Christianity in, uh, was introduced in the Roman Empire, and slavery persisted in the Islamic world un until, um, well, essentially the, the modern age, the 19th century. And uh, uh, the Europeans, of course, used slavery in uh, North America and the Caribbean. So you can see uh, Confucius, uh, who's one of the, uh, who's the founder of Confucianism, a, a, which is basically a philosophy, not a religion. He's a, there's a portrait of him in the bottom left. And so he was present in the feudal period, during the Warring States period, from 700 to 200 uh, BC in China, in an age when you had a lot of different philosophies. And so he was proposing a moral order to bring stability to uh, Chinese society as it evolved from a feudal system where you had lords delegating control of land to lesser lords who would then uh, give an oath of fealty. In other words, they would say, I, I give my loyalty to you in exchange for you giving me power over this land. And there are some benefits, except, of course, if you're a warrior, you're fighting all the time. And so lords would uh, gather coalitions of some of their lords to suppress some of their other lords that would rebel, and they would extract service from these lords uh, uh, into armies to attack or defend against neighbors. And then on the right, you can see a depiction of the bureaucratic period of China. Essentially, feudalism was replaced by uh, in the period of uh, Qin Shi Huangdi and uh, Han Wuti, which we'll talk about in a moment. And you have the, uh, the emergence of exams where uh, uh, um, individuals who had access to books um, would learn uh, to read and write, and they would then write exams to demonstrate their knowledge of classical literature. Uh, obviously, the content of the literature didn't matter so much, although it was thought that it was important that these individuals had some moral education to make sure they were not corrupt. Um, but uh, it was essentially a test of their technical skills and their memory and their uh, their calligraphy uh, and their uh, mathematical skills. And then these individuals would work uh, at you know at various different locations in the state. Um, so you can see that uh, depicted here. Obviously, it's an activity of the uh, of, of the privileged because in order to get access to books in an age when um, printing was still very expensive, uh, you have to you have to come from a wealthy family, and so you have a lot of powerful individuals who failed the exam, including the leader of the Taiping Rebellion in the nineteenth century, which is the world's largest uh, peasant uprising, which killed up to twenty million people and almost. Uh, captured Shanghai in the 1860s. Ultimately, the Chinese government uh, suppressed it, but it left China incredibly weakened, ultimately led to the collapse of uh, China's uh, monarchical dynasty in 1911 and sort of set the stage for the invasion of China that led to the uh, Second World War. So the third explanation for the puzzle of China's centralization is that um, it's just not true. It's not true that China is hyper-centralized. If you were to compare it as a test case against the Roman Empire. So 
here we can see on the bottom right a map of the Roman Empire at its largest extent in 117 AD, and we can see a Roman property document in the center. That's an ancient document, uh, 1600 uh, years old. You can see a Roman court layout, um, uh, which would have occurred in the cathedra. Uh, and the cathedra, of course, is this legal hall that was later used as the architectural source for European uh, cathedrals. But the, the key difference between Rome and China is that China spent about half of its time not unified. And this is important. You do have a recurrence of monarchical systems that unify China under an emperor uh, starting with the northern plain and then extending out from that central northern plain. And so you have, the, you have a Chinese culture where most people agree that China should be unified. Where that capital is specifically doesn't matter. You could have uh, Beijing, which basically means northern capital. You could have Nanjing, which basically means western capital, Bei meaning Bay meaning north and Nan meaning west. So you can move the capital around and just you know give it a cardinal point to say where it goes. Now in, in contrast for the Roman Empire, it lasted continuously without disintegration. Uh, and so you had a continuous bureaucratic practice from around the sixth century, which is the beginning of the Roman monarchy. Now the Roman monarchy was not Roman. It was essentially made up of, of Etruscans mix, intermixed with, with Greek uh, mercantile class, but they provided some of the, the core sources of Roman tradition that fed into religion and the bureaucracy. And even though Rome itself collapsed, the identity of being Roman carried on into uh, Constantinople and into what the Western Europeans called Byzantium that fell in 1453. That's 2,100 years of uninterrupted continuous history. Now, uh, of course, there's a big uh, debate over this, over whether, uh, you know, uh, uh, over the, the precise variable I'm about to identify. But the Roman Empire um, wasn't unified because of the common language. It had both Roman and um, and Greek. It wasn't unified because of religion. A lot of the religious differences that occurred, uh, even with the introduction of uh, Christianity, wasn't resolved until long after um, the Western Roman Empire collapsed and even the Eastern Empire had to deal with it. So religion and, and m many of the Christians in Byzantium were actually in Egypt. And so you have a large uh, Arab and um, Amazir component uh, to religion, like, you know, the, the, the St. Augustine, the city of God. Not a European, but an Amazir from uh, Algeria. So, uh, it's not religion. Um, what unified Rome was its legal system that made uh, records of contracts, primarily property contracts, work contracts, and marriage contracts that were stored in the tabularium or the records office of every single city. And the building you see here, which is just outside of the Forum in Rome, it's today a series of apartments, the base of that building was the tabularium of Rome. Rome persisted because the legitimacy of the state was based on property rights, which people fought to defend to the very end. So even when the emperor was corrupt and barbarians invaded, property owners maintained the bureaucracy for a very long time. And it wasn't until the, um, uh, you know, the, the emergence of more advanced state structures uh, in the form of the Western uh, European states in the early modern period that that political form was replaced. So this is the big difference. China had property rights, but it wasn't as decentralized as the Roman system, and because the emperor could override the property rights of its citizens, there was less legitimacy. So peasants would very likely revolt against a system that they thought was unfair. In Europe, you had uh, the same level of revolt, um, but uh, the solution was uh, the resolution of property rights that could then be uh, incorporated into these, uh, the tabularium. And you know, when the slaves became um, uh, very powerful, uh, and a threat to society because of the accumulation of rights, Christianity in the Roman Empire just came along and, and uh, outlawed uh, slavery. So, uh, the, the third solution uh, to this puzzle is that, in fact, uh, you know, China has a long history of secession and rebellion and has spent as much time 
uh, conquered by foreign peoples and not in some sort of imperial dynastic form as it has spent uh, in uh, the different uh, dynasties. In contrast, uh, the Roman Empire could be argued to have been more centralized all the way up until uh, 1453. And you have some states like uh, France, for example, whose capital city of Paris has been occupied very, uh, uh, very few times since the, uh, uh, f the, the collapse of the Republic of Soissons, which is this rump uh, Roman state and its occupation uh, by the Franks in the 5th century until uh, the Europeans marched into Paris after the defeat of Napoleon. Only three or four times was Paris occupied. Uh, it was sieged many times, and so you have these powerful Western European states that have a longevity, even though France is small, that have a longevity that's far older than any dynastic uh, period of, of continuity in China. So China's not that centralized politically. It's sort of a European myth. Now, a part of this myth is the way that Europeans learned about uh, China. Louis XIV, France, organized by Cardinal uh, Richelieu, and in the long French tradition of centralized uh, and organized state power under um, bureaucratic leaders like uh, Colbert, they I idealized China as this ultimate bureaucratic state of efficiency. But France is Louis XIV, and subsequent French state organization was a lot more efficient than China's uh, bureaucracy. Because the French were in continuous competition against the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the Spanish, uh, the English, and so their bureaucratic forms were tested um, by uh, uh, the close proximity of military competitors. Where China's priority was primarily uh, political stability and isolation from uh, foreigners. Qin Shi Huangdi's initial attempt at Chinese empire failed dramatically because of his failure to consolidate a bureaucracy over prior uh, uh, deep-rooted feudal forms. And so you have the emergence of the Han Empire after the collapse of uh, uh, the, the Qin Dynasty under uh, Qin Shi Huangdi, China's first emperor's son. The consolidation of China's empire was much more thorough under the hand. This is a, a true bureau bureaucratization. They completely abandoned, abandoned the feudal system practiced by the Zhou princes since 1100 uh, BC. So this is 900 years later. Here they uproot and disenfranchise the lords and replace them with their tr rotated bureaucrats. There's a concerted creation of a bureaucracy that is all pervasive. Uh, and you can see here in this map, uh, in what is sort of a, a, a maroon color, the expansion outward of the Han Empire into what is what we recognize today to be the eastern part of China. This is the core image that the Han people have of what China should be. Tibet is commonly recognized as a territory of China, but inhabited by Tibetans. And you have, of course, uh, Mongolia, uh, inner and outer, which is north of the Wall of China. And you've got uh, Xinjiang, which is the new territories that are depicted here as the Takli Taklimakan, where the Han Dynasty is expanded to. But where the Han people live today uh, is uh, not simply a function of conquest, but of population relocation and integration of local indigenous peoples into Chinese culture. Now, a lot of people were pushed out. Southeast Asia, people like the Vietnamese, were physically pushed into South Asia and contracting the Khmer Empire, which is you know, what we have today as Cambodia. Cambodia used to dominate most of Southeast Asia, and the migration of the peoples out of China, pushed by the Han Empire's military conquests and, po and forced population movements led to that migration period. So China today is really an image of empire and territory created by the Emperor Han Wu Ti of 141 to 87 BC, which is basically a contemporary or just prior to the civil war in Rome that led to the creation of the Roman Empire. So this is before, for example, uh, Julius Caesar. This is the same time as the social wars in Rome. 
Again, Rome is, is, is a struggling republic trying to secure its uh, some sort of constitutional equilibrium and stability, where China already has a sophisticated, widespread bureaucracy um, that is, you know, in, in, on, on the order of the number of members of the bureaucracy, probably a thousand times bigger than the Roman bureaucracy of praetors, aediles, and quaestors. So this is important because it forms the basis for what the Chinese believe is the legitimate outlines of what China is, and therefore the legitimate outline of what the Chinese are willing to fight for in order to preserve their internal sense of security, which is an important baseline when we want to determine um, the legitimate uh, extent of a country and to what extent the people will resist um, exertions of power from outside. So when we go back to the century of shame, we can see how these areas, many of them are add-ons in the post-Han Wu-Ti period, which means they probably are uh, sacrificable in the Chinese sense. Mongolia, for example, there's no compelling historical imagination requiring that it be reincorporated. The uh, uh, Qing dynasty under the Manchu did conquer Mongolia. Uh, it's the source of the Mongols that had conquered uh, China in 1200. But China could uh, uh, survive without um, altering its identity as Han, without having to reconquer it. Uh, Korea could probably remain um, uh, uh, independent of tribute to Beijing. Although, you know, being, being a regional country and being a Confucian just like China, it shares a great many values, and so you'd expect some sort of uh, uh, discourse and interaction. Um, so, although China plays on the century of shame, not all of these territories are being aggressively sought for reincorporation. And that's important. So here again you can see the ethnic distribution in China and the result of Han Wu Ti's policy of assimilation and forced migration. The brown are the Han population. Now you do have Hui. Hui are ethnically Han people who've adopted the Muslim religion. Now in China, unlike political Islam and unlike medieval Europe, religion is not synonymous with the state. In Europe you had a dual loyalty system where the church would grant religious legitimacy to secular rules to rule and the secular rulers would then protect the church. In political Islam, the individual political leader would, could also be the religious leader, although they would be advised by um, a, a special legal scholars from the Ummah. In China, you can have a loyal Chinese citizen without suspicion, um, uh, despite having a religion that is not Taoist, that is not Confucian, that is not Buddhist, that is not atheist communist. So religion is less important in China as a measure of, the, of, of allegiance to the polity. You can see uh, the, the Thai people in the south, and these Thai people are of course very similar to the people from Thailand. This is the uh, source region for many of the people in Southeast Asia. Uh, like the Vietnamese who were pushed by migration. You can see the Miao Yao. This is of course a mountainous region, so you have a fair bit of ethnic mixing. You can see uh, Tibeto Burman people also in that uh, south southern uh, region in what is uh, Yunnan. Um, uh, on the uh, uh, northern western region, uh, you can see Mongolic and Turkic and um, uh, peoples in Xinjiang. Uh, those people are largely Muslim and they're influenced by political Islam. And because uh, the idea that religion is associated with politics, uh, and because of the differences in ethnicity and language, these populations are restive and don't want to be ruled by China. But it should be qualified that many of these ethnic groups participated as loyal Chinese during the 1920s and 1930s. And, and assisted the Chinese state, even when under warlord rulership, to join with the Guomintang to fight the Japanese. And so uh, uh, identities change. And it's, it's not true that all of these um, uh, non-Han people were, were in the long term seeking uh, independence uh, from the state. Although certainly uh, they would want a lot of autonomy. One of the most ancient cities 
in the far west of China is Kashgar. And uh, the, the Chinese have been physically present in Kashgar for uh, over 2,000 years. And this is a, essentially a Central Asian city uh, that's Chinese to its core. And it's fully legitimate. Um, even other people in Central Asia see as, le uh, as legitimate. And the Chinese presence in Central Asia, although gone today, um, occurred for centuries. Uh, after Han Wu Ti moved the Chinese polity into Central Asia, and it was not until the seventh century at the Battle of Talash that an Arab Muslim invasion ejected the Chinese. So we're talking about centuries of rule uh, in the post Alexander the Great period in Central Asia. Centuries, almost half a millennium of Chinese rule. Although, again, in, in, in the modern Chinese imagination, that Chinese presence is now gone and is therefore not a political consequential event. Um, you can see some Koreans in, in the north, around Harbin and Shenyang, in the northeastern section of China. Again, this was mostly not a Han area until 1875, when the uh, Qing Dynasty opened up that region for migration in order to offset uh, the arrival of the Russians in Vladivostok and Khabarovsk uh, from the uh, railway system. Um, and you can see Taiwan on the uh, East Coast, the significant Indonesian uh, population, which is the indigenous uh, people that live there. And you can even see that on Hainan Island, which, which, is the, uh, which is where Sanya is, one of China's major military bases today. It's very unlikely China would give up Hainan. They see it as a core part of Chinese territory. And so the, the yellow color and the red colors you see in the interior, those are recognized as being a legitimate uh, parts of China. And there the Chinese would be invested in holding on to China. So when we talk about China uh, uh, disintegrating in the way that the Soviet Union did, or Russia could, um, you have a much higher level of integration. China is 94% Han, where Russia is only about 70% uh, Russian. And so you have a much higher likelihood of Russia, which is much more spread out, and essentially unnaturally, unnaturally stretched across the Eurasian landmass all the way to the uh, Pacific Ocean. China's more centralized and the peripheral populations are in mountainous areas and they account for a very small part of the population of less fertile land and so they're not, they're, they're, there's almost no prospect for them to secede. Tibet could, Xinjiang could in the same way that Mongolia did, but these areas seceded with the help, like Mongolia, of outside powers. So China's contemporary geogra geographic extent is defined by Emperor Han Wuti, who again ruled from 141 to 87 BC. He dispatched international embassies to places as far as Parthia, which was a, a significant uh, Iranian polity, uh, although the Parthians themselves are Central Asian nomads, uh, on the border of the Roman Empire. China saw itself as the Central Kingdom, you know, hence the name Zhangguo, but essentially the, 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 the core state and all the other states were smaller and therefore uh, connected in a tributary system so that China could have influence over their foreign policy with the net goal of reducing war and reducing instability. Uh, Han Wuti displaced the feudal system and created a centralized bureaucratic elite on, on an order much more uh, complex and uh, widespread than under Qin Shi Huangdi. And you had a state with a strict and consistent laws throughout the empire. There were periods of warfare and migration and popu population relocation, and there were policies focused on economic growth, but most of those were uh, uh, occurred in such a way that it enhanced the power of the state. Hanuti reduced the court conference, which was essentially the nobles of the family, and replaced it with a non-deliberative executive branch of the emperorship. In other words, bureaucrats that would execute the decision of the emperor throughout the empire. Obviously, there was a significant amount of flexibility for local requirements. The emperor was not totalitarian given the limits of the technology at the time, but to ensure a sense of legitimacy, which essentially means uh, recognized justice, the laws had to be fair throughout the land, and there was, you know, there's no more slavery, you have peasants, and to minimize peasant rebellions and to increase their productivity, you have to create the kind of stability that would allow people to invest in the land they were working on, in the, in the mercantile projects they set up. And so it benefited the population. 
uh, in, in the same way that we saw the, Rome, the Roman imperial system creating a set of laws and sustaining infrastructure created stability. People need stability for their daily lives as well as larger public projects. There was a rise of a professional military that replaced feudal conscription, so no longer was there a, a, a levy of a massive un, untrained temporary peasants, uh, but you had large horse farms and the Chinese military would uh, create large mobile uh, horse armies, no longer chariots, but now cavalry, and they would use them efficiently against the nomadic people of the north, uh, like the, the Sing Nu, the Huns that later hit Europe, or, or you know the, the type of horse riders like the uh, Mongols. The Mongols became a threat during ecological periods when they would uh, spread. But if the Chinese state was strong and organized and had an efficient taxation system and not corrupt, in, in the Chinese historiography, it's a period, they have this image of, of, of every dynasty eventually becomes decadent and they tie it to moral issues. Um, that is very, very debatable and certainly worth uh, testing. Um, but uh, you know, it's not supported by common sense sociology. Empires fall for a variety of reasons and not necessarily because the emperor themselves were incompetent. You could have a very, very incompetent emperor if the bureaucracy could function on its own like it did in the Roman Empire where the bureaucracy persisted for 2,100 years despite some very incompetent emperors, then the, the empire would persist. But an organized Chinese state could always create a cavalry force stronger than any of its nomadic neighbors. Once the state became weak, then it would, be, it would fall prey to them. There was a marginalization of commerce and a focus on government monopolies to raise money on things like taxes and alcohol, gambling, all these sorts of things. Um, but the marginalization of commerce, and the same thing occurred in the Roman Empire, you had a, a bias against uh, the wealthy commercial class, the equites, because they made a lot more money than the landowners. Uh, the landowners um, had the land which contained the peasants that would form the core of the army. Now in the Roman Empire that failed, you had a lot of fundia, large numbers of slaves, and so the, the state actually was hollowed out by a professional army. But in China, uh, the amount of bribes that could occur from these commercial classes and the fact that they didn't contribute to the wealth of the state because it was difficult to tax them, these wine merchants and these, these coal merchants, uh, so uh, they didn't have a lot of status. They were seen as a source of instability, uh, even though they developed many of the technological uh, discoveries that, that the Tan Dynasty was known for. So Han Wu Ti unified essentially a nation state empire as the legitimate political concept worthy of allegiance by the majority of the Chinese population, and that persists to, to this day. Han Wuti's empire hit logistical and, li and geographic limits of expansion. He basically expanded on, onto the sea, to the mountains, to the steppes and the deserts, and then stopped. It just became too expensive to expand beyond it because you couldn't collect tax revenue. Now, the reason Han Wuti's empire expanded into Central Asia is because of the lucrative exports from China to uh, the Near East and Europe. And uh, the Romans, of course, um, uh, bore the brunt of that. They could not compete with Chinese exports. And so a lot of the specie, uh, essentially the silver coinage in the Roman Empire, uh, ended up being traded to China in exchange for Chinese exports. So China was uh, commercially more productive and wealthier uh, in terms of its uh, exported manufacturers than the Roman Empire. Uh, China also could not overcome the resistance of the outer ethnic minorities. So China occasionally occupied Vietnam, but could never uh, impose its own culture on the Vietnamese or the Koreans, uh, who persistently uh, resisted to this day. Um, though China had one state and one written language, it was multi-ethnic, multilingual, uh, multi-region and multi-religious and that model uh, persists uh, to this day. Now the imperial, imperial reputation depended on both Wukong, which is military success, obviously to preserve stability against external threats, as well as Wen Qi, which is civil and military merit. In other words, you have to be strong and you have to have justice. If you didn't have justice, people would revolt. So you have to have laws that were fair. And this is, of course, always a challenge in a political system as large as China with such variation in the characteristics of its citizenry.
So dynasties are judged, and this is dynasties after the Han, are judged by how they uphold Han Wuti's territory. The Song dynasty and the Ming dynasty were seen as weak, and the Tang dynasty and the Manchu, even though the Manchu, the Qing dynasty, were not ethnically Chinese, they were judged to be strong. So foreigners could achieve legitimacy if they could achieve Han Wuti's ideal. I mean, it's rather bizarre, but under the Qing dynasty of the Manchu, the head of the augury department, because of his mathematical skill, was a Jesuit, a Christian from Europe, a European. There was no problem uh, integrating him because China already had a system of um, uh, incorporating highly skilled individuals regardless of their ethnic identity or their religion. Marco Polo had a similar experience in the Yuan dynasty when the Mongols were ruling China. They were hiring the best and the best. Merchants happened to have the, the literacy and the quantitative skills and a good sense of geography and experience to be excellent administrators. Religion is very important. It's a part of the daily life of most individuals in the world, even today. One of the issues that China has today is a form of spiritual vacuum. When I first visited China, there were a great many churches, and there was a great concern within the Chinese government that basement Christianity, in other words, Protestant evangelicals operating from their basements, uh, Christianity was spreading more quickly than the membership of the Communist Party. So the Communist Party today about, has about a hundred and something million members, which is about seven or eight percent of the Chinese population. Many of those are just municipal workers who are, have a, it's an outlet for ideological contribution to society. So these are not uh, coercive individuals, they're, they're uh, public servants who want to do social good in various different uh, governmental forms. But uh, Christianity spread because of a spiritual vacuum, largely the result of the Cultural Revolution, but something which has been persistent in China for a very long time when the state takes too much control over religion. When I visited China a few years later, every single church I visited had been, had been shut down. And religion is very often a mechanism for social organization. So a lot of the uh, uh, largest churches were in places like Wanzhou, in Zhejiang province. And this is because you have commercial communities that use the churches as an identity focal point. And uh, Wenzhou, for example, is very famous for its capitalist-like activity. China's constantly having to deal with people from there who are uh, underhandedly engaging in financial organization to create uh, uh, commercial entities that the state is not in control of. I think that's very common. Um, uh, that you have, uh, for example, in the European experience, uh, the Protestants of, of um, the Netherlands, uh, you know, that were focused on by Max Weber in his focus on the relationship between Protestantism and early uh, capitalist behavior by entrepreneurs and the new uh, middle class. So China uh, has, in some sense, a spiritual vacuum, which is why it's not static. I mean, we think of the Roman Empire, it, it, it adopted the initial religious forms of the Etruscans, which are learned from the Greeks, during moments of crisis, like the Hannibal's um, invasion of Italy, you had the adoption of, of the cult of Isis, which is an Eastern Mediterranean religion of, of, that's evolved into the Virgin Mary. Then you have the introduction of the Judaic uh, Nazarene uh, monotheistic religion, which has its origins, of course, in, uh, uh, in Zoroastrianism, the concept of good and evil, which is what the, the, the Jews were exposed to during their captivity in Babylon. Uh, and then, uh, 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 you know, post-Roman post Empire, you have an evolution into, into Protestantism. Uh, and of course, the uh, Christians of the uh, southern Mediterranean coast adopted Islam, which is in many ways very similar to Christianity. In uh, China, you have uh, an evolution of, of local forms of religion, a state codification uh, into Confucianism. Um, it's hollowing out spiritually, and so the Chinese adoption of, of Buddhism, and then um, Buddhism no longer being useful to the state, and the reintroduction of Neo-Confucianism uh, in, in around uh, 1400 and 1500. And so China's gone through its own variations of religions, and then during the Cultural Revolution, essentially an, an assault on Chinese traditional religion, and then a re-emergence of new religion. And that's why China is so... Uh, susceptible and suspicious of cults. Uh, 
Um, and uh, I mean, there's a number of, of religions in China that, that China sees as a political threat, which is why any adherent of any religion or practitioner of a religion or a leader of a religious community must receive their salary from the state, regardless of what religion is they are from, and so it has to be registered. There are a great many Muslims in China. Uh, and when I visited the city of Xi'an, we went into uh, this very ancient mosque, and it, uh, the workers there um, were paid for by the state. The state administers um, uh, uh, religion. So Han Wu Ti obviously uh, took a great deal of interest in the spiritual governance of his subjects because religions guide the ethical um, behavior of the population. Now it should be qualified in any society I would I would cynically argue that between a quarter to a third of individuals are actually uh, um, uh, uh, sort of against the norms of the society. So if you know you're driving down a highway, you see how many people speed. Probably a third to a quarter of people don't care about the rules of society, either because they don't care about other people, or they see the religious norms as restraining them against stupid people. And so, and of course, they could be atheists. There were a great many Chinese atheists. There's a a well-known Chinese bureaucrat. Uh, who, uh, in his atheism, made the observation that uh, when people die, they leave their clothes behind. And a lot of people have died. And a lot of people are old. And so he speculated heaven is basically large numbers of naked old people standing close to each other. In other words, not a paradise. Now this individual was a problem employee, and he was fired multiple times. But um, he was uh, a very good writer, and so we have a lot of his uh, writings uh, left over from the period. So um, don't think that Chinese thinking is uniform. There's a, you know, a great diversity and comedy in a lot of uh, Chinese thinkers. So here in the images, we see Confucius on the left. Uh, we can see the Taoists, which is really a mystical village religion, and is the oldest religion of China. And then we see Mohism on uh, the extreme right. So state Confucianism emerged under Han Wu Ti uh, when he ended Chinese intellectualism. So the great explosion of ideas that you had uh, within uh, China during the Warring States period was ended. He needed to centralize religion in order to, uh, to some extent, control how people uh, saw the state by showing how the state uh, had patronage over the religion and to get rid of those elements of religion that were anti state. So he, he codified, he hired religious writers in the bureaucracy to jettison some parts of the religion, to codify it, and then to publicize and spread those values. And so Confucianism is not an independent philosophy. It's a state-backed philosophy that spread widely. So you have uh, Taoism, which is a traditional vill village religion. Taoism is, is, there's a lot of philosophy associated with it. And there's a, there's a, a village version which is you know, very simply based upon um, the mysteries of life, the mysteries of nature. And then you've got a more intellectual uh, version, like, like the Upanishads. The Tao itself means negative. So it means um, uh, you achieve happiness um, by sort of negating yourself. It's like being sort of a piece of grass uh, um, going with the wind. Uh, and, and so Taoism includes uh, you know, a, a whole theology of the underworld and of demons and, and, and of augury and of communicating to your ancestors. Uh, there's Mohism, which is a ruler and ruled contract. And uh, this is, you know, again, it, it anticipates many of the much later traditions in Europe. Right? There's a, a very, very sophisticated uh, amount, of, um, amount of entrepreneurial intellectualism in China during the Warring States period. And finally, there's legalism. Legalism is probably the core of the Chinese state, and uh, it, it started with Qin Shi Huangdi, and probably before in during the Warring States period, and endured uh, to this day. Right, and all of these as state-sponsored religions um, uh, persisted until 1911. Now, the Mandate of Heaven gave Han Wu Ti uh, legitimacy in his rule. But he was also seen, here manipulating the religious symbology, he was a messianic savior. He was the Shang Wang, or the sage emperor of ancient legends for the Chinese people. And he also sought the moral obligation to evangelize barbarians to justify imperial expansion. It's very common for religions just to, to solve the, 
the, the essential question. Why would I join your religion instead of another religion? Well, it's because our religion is better. Well, if your religion is better, why aren't you spreading it? And so, logically, religions have to spread in order to justify themselves if, if they're based on nothing else except the competition of ideas. And so, there was a close association between these Chinese religions and the expansion of the Chinese state to civilize the rest of the planet. And ultimately, you, you could expand this to uh, a universal world rule. You know, whether it's, it's uh, the expansion of human rights in a religious European form, uh, which was also used during uh, European colonialism, or the spread of uh, political uh, Islam um, from a theocratic state like Iran, the idea is um, we're spreading justice. And uh, 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 the, the emperor was also the link to the gods and the ancestors. And this involved sacrifices at the Thai mountain uh, to manage bad omens uh, for the people. The people are very superstitious if you're a farmer because nature can be horrendously um, impactful. And so people are fatalistic. They need to have these symbolic interactions with nature. The last emperor of China was not, or the empress of China was not Wu Tsi. Uh, of the of the Qing dynasty, who was overthrown in 1911, but uh, Yuan Shikai, who was a general commanding a Chinese uh, contingent of the Manchu army. And when the Qing dynasty was overthrown in 1911, he took over as a warlord. He became the first president, and briefly, during the war in Europe, World War I, he became emperor. And the Japanese advised him, don't do this. And most Chinese objected to it. But one of his first acts was to sacrifice a chicken. And this is uh, the duty of the Chinese uh, emperor. And so the last animal sacrifice in China was 1911. And this was a normal act to appease the gods. They're giving the gods something in exchange for control over the weather. Now, human sacrifice was a large part of Chinese tradition in the same way that it was in, uh, uh, say, uh, say Teotihuacan or the Aztecs uh, in Mexico. Um, and it goes back to, as I previously mentioned, the way that hunters interact um, with nature around them. Because, you know, humans don't like killing animals, believe it or not. And so they, there's a certain amount of guilt the more that you see personality in animals as you know, anyone who's a pet owner uh, recognizes. So the emperor was to rule through virtue and put emphasis on farming over commerce and industry. And so all of the local gods were consolidated into a single hierarchy. Again, the Romans did the same thing. You had a certain amount of hierarchy where you had your ancestral uh, uh, spirits that you worshipped, uh, and then you'd have your local spirits rural spirits, and then you had your local gods, and then you had the state religion of the emperor as god in um, the Roman Empire. Um, and you know, it persisted to this day. The Vatican's built upon a, a prior pagan temple in Rome. They used to collect taxes as early as the 8th century. So uh, religious people demand continuity. The same thing in China. I mean, if you, if you visit um, uh, the various religious shrines that sustained the Chinese emperors in Beijing, you'll see a lot of continuity going back um, a millennia. So Confucian values, and this is a very important uh, philosophy because it provides a legitimacy for the state, because it both demands obedience along certain norms and promises uh, treatment according to the principles of justice. So you have Jen, which is kindness, Yi, which is righteousness, Li, which is uh, propriety, uh, including uh, filial piety, in other words, taking care of one's parents, listening uh, uh, to elders, Qi, which is wisdom, Xin, which is truthfulness, Chung, which is loyalty, Shu, which is forgiveness, and Qing, which is respect. So this is a reproducible structure that goes from the family to the extended family all the way to the larger uh, uh, political system. And so this is an easy model um, uh, for the state to reproduce because everyone recognizes what a family looks like. And so the emperor was depicted as the head of the family. So here you can see the Ming Dynasty. This is uh, a period just before the modern emergence of the Europeans. The Ming were a, uh, a very important, uh, again, they were economically the wealthiest political system in the world at the time. Uh, 
But you had a religious transformation that occurred around the time of these naval expeditions. So these arrows show the naval expedition of Admiral Zheng He. Zheng He was a eunuch. He was a child attacked in a Chinese raid because of a rebellion. He was castrated, but then he worked his way into the bureaucracy, a very intelligent individual. Now, he could do this because uh, in the political system at the time, which was Buddhist, you had eunuchs that were working for the Chinese government. But there was a cultural revolution going on in China where the Buddhists were being replaced by uh, Neo-Confucians, and they were replacing the eunuchs with family members. So it's sort of a reversion to some level of uh, Buddhism. So what China did in, at this time was build a fleet of ships. Now, we don't want to exaggerate the power of these ships because these ships were the largest the world had ever seen as a flotilla, were crossing uh, the oceans and were uh, not looking for commerce in, in the sense of trying to get uh, returns on investment like European uh, leaders, but trying to establish polity to polity trade uh, essentially palace trade, which is, a, which is a traditional form of trade, where not the people or the merchants are trading, but rather governments are trading with each other, as a way of establishing uh, China's centrality. And it's a form of tribute, and therefore to control the foreign policy of other states. And uh, China certainly acted uh, quite aggressively. It's not true that this fleet was entirely peaceful. There was a dispute in Ceylon, what is today Sri Lanka and southern India. The Chinese landed marines and made captive the local leader and brought him back to China and replaced him with a leader that was more amenable to Chinese uh, values. And you can see the uh, fleet went all the way to the Strait of Hormuz, to Jeddah. Uh, and this is uh, 1433. All right, just as the Portuguese are beginning to organize. Now, because of this uh, religious transformation going on in China, the fleet returned to China and was burned. And Zheng He was put out of a job, and China never established colonies. And the Chinese to this day regret the structure of the state prioritizing stability instead of growth. I mean, Catherine the Great, the Russian Tsarina, said, um, if Russia's not expanding, it's dying. All right, and so um, this is sort of European philosophy, which is you have to expand or people will conquer you. And that comes out of a environment of endless, difficult warfare in Europe. China, China on the other hand, was looking for stability. So there was no incentive in China to, uh, to, to conquer Australia uh, or North America and build colonies. It was simply trying to take care of its local environment to um, uh, create stability so that the regime was not threatened by those from outside. So ultimately, the fleet disappeared. Uh, and then um, the uh, Portuguese showed up. Uh, Vasco da Gama uh, circumvented the, um, the Cape of Good Hope, entered the Indian Ocean. And then Albuquerque showed up. Uh, when Albuquerque showed up, um, about 75 years after this, he conquered the entire Indian Ocean. And the Europeans have been the dominant naval power since then, in the last 500 years, and this allowed the Europeans uh, to destroy the large traditional empires of Asia and to colonize large tracts of the world. Uh, and so, you know, England had a population of two million at the beginning of this period when Zheng He sailed all the way uh, to the Near East, uh, you know, off the coast of, of what is today Saudi Arabia. And uh, today, that, that tiny little country of England um, has the, 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 the principal language and the principal legal system and uh, political cultural form uh, spread across uh, the planet. Here you can see uh, what Zheng He's fleet would have looked like if it was concentrated. But again, uh, let's not exaggerate the power of the fleet. The Portuguese vessels were probably only one-tenth of the tonnage and size of a Chinese ship. But Portuguese vessels were uh, built by a, a maritime society, the Portuguese, um, who'd been uh, crossing parts of the Atlantic for centuries and the Mediterranean, and their ships lasted up to a century, where Chinese ships, uh, because China didn't have the same maritime tradition, were follow, fa falling apart uh, um, uh, due to maintenance problems much earlier. So Chinese ships were big, but um, they weren't as uh, durable as the uh, vessels of the Mediterranean. Here's a comparison of a Chinese vessel next to a, a Spanish uh, caravel. 
again, we don't exaggerate the Spanish fleet. The Portuguese had an organized state fleet. The Spanish uh, mostly contracted uh, private mercantile vessels, and the Spanish, believe it or not, didn't have an imperial fleet until about a century and a half into their empire. It was mostly um, uh, merchants organizing their own ships. China's ships were state-created, state-funded, state-organized, state-built. Uh, and, and so in that sense, China had um, a much better developed bureaucracy for deliberate exploration. Imagine a world where the Chinese used their ships to enforce Chinese power and didn't destroy it for domestic reasons, and thereby were able to maintain power on the same levels of the Europeans. Imagine a counterfactual world where China has ships that reach all the way to North America and South America. Now, there are a couple of um, popular books out there that claim that China did get to North America, but there's absolutely no evidence. There's a stone, uh, a circular a donut-shaped stone that's similar to a Chinese anchor that was found in a harbor in um, California, but there are multiple explanations for an anchor like that. It's far more likely that the, the Spanish once they had conquered Mexico, um, had uh, ships going uh, from Central and um, uh, places like California all the way to China. If you go to Mexico City and you go to the main cathedral in the downtown of uh, Tecnotitlan, which is, the, of course, the main pyramid for the Aztec state, uh, which was buried, the cathedral next to it has an organ that was built in China in uh, the Portuguese colony of Macau and then brought to the Mexican colony uh, in Mexico uh, around the 1540s or the 1550s, which is just 30 years after the uh, Mexicans um, uh, took over, uh, rather were conquered by the Spanish. So there's a lot of commerce there would have accounted for that. But you can see here in this counterfactual, the Brazilians would have been, or rather the Brazilian coast would have been taken by the Portuguese, you have the Spanish and the English in North America, but China would have had a presence. And so there would have been a very different a demographic um, difference in the world. And the Chinese to this day regret this um, essentially force uh, a, a failure to anticipate uh, the historical impact of not expanding to compete with the Europeans. One of the reasons that justifies China's heavy expenditure into a fleet is not only the century of shame when European maritime powers were able to impose control over China, including limiting its ability to engage in commerce and therefore get wealth through trade, but also because the fact that the Europeans were able to dominate such a large part of the planet by seizing control of prime agricultural territory uh, that they used to then uh, physically and culturally spread um, uh, their control of the earth. Places like North and South America and Australia, but also uh, parts of Africa, as well as the domination of territories that did not involve the same scale of colonialism. Now, China's success and rises and falls, along with its dynasties, on a number of factors. First, the volatility of the northern nomads. Today, that's not such a big issue. But historically, the agricultural people of China were not martial people. They didn't learn the skills in agriculture that naturally lent itself to military uh, operations, as well as the Chinese didn't want to give them that training. Otherwise, it would have empowered them uh, to revolt instead of using the legal system. And so there are a great many limitations on how well the peasants could be armed. And when they were armed, they were raised as a mass levy and inevitably they didn't perform very well. Where the nomads of the north, the skills used to manage a herd, to move, to fight against wolves that would be attacking the young foals and the young animals of their herd, um, those skills could equally be used to conquer uh, uh, entire countries or to pillage um, uh, farmland. Number two, the management of a loss of political control emerges with population growth. And this has been a constant problem in China where you have this paradox of a very wealthy agricultural area, the population gets too large, this leads to migration, and if there's too much people in an area, they could revolt. 
Or if they migrate, the center then loses control over the population that's moved to this new area. And number three, the problem of the centralization of the empire that depends on one person. So it's not, I mean, it, it, this is a, a point that requires a lot of elaboration because there's a great many variables here. But sometimes core personalities matter and sometimes they don't. It depends on the advice. It depends on how independent the bureaucracy is. It depends on how much power that individual exercises, whether that individual exercises it um, uh, with deference uh, to good advice. So sometimes individuals matter and they have a huge disproportionate impact and other times they're a cog in a broader machine and there are compensatory mechanisms that keep the state going. And so this is something that has to be determined and not uh, assumed. And you can see, you know, Mao Zedong in the bottom right corner, he did have a bureaucracy that was uh, created in, in, in uh, a conflict against both the Japanese against the Guomintang that allowed him to have a disproportionate impact on history, although it shouldn't be exaggerated. His policies occurred because the elite around him in many cases agreed with his policies, including the Great Leap Forward that killed 20 to 30 million uh, Chinese peasants in the period of 1957 uh, to 1959. Now, Zheng He's fleet was canceled because of the expense and the absence of strategic logic. Uh, you had uh, Arab merchants operating along the routes, and so the Chinese state couldn't quite figure out why they would have to pay for this fleet when the Arab merchants were more than happy uh, to provide uh, those uh, services. They were incentivized by trade. Uh, so you had uh, such merchants as Ibn Patuta, uh, an Arab trader who traveled from Morocco all the way to China and wrote about it extensively. And so the Arabs had a lot more experience than the Chinese on not traveling, but traveling and making it profitable to commercial exchange. Now the war in Vietnam and against the Mongols was more important for the survival of the Chinese state in terms of providing stability uh, for its agricultural system. China therefore focused on building the Great Wall, which was financed by silver from Europe. Now specifically, it was uh, a silver from the Spanish Empire that effectively went directly from uh, Bolivia's Potosi silver mine, which today is still one of the largest silver mines in the world, and then went directly to China to pay for luxuries that were then going to Europe uh, through other routes and basically went through um, the pre-existing uh, Manila trade route that China had uh, with the Philippines um, before uh, the Spanish under, under um, Magellan even showed up. Uh, the primary Chinese exports were silk, tea, and porcelain uh, in exchange for these uh, European goods. Here you can see the Chinese uh, building the Great Wall that was largely um, financed by the surpluses of Chinese trade with Europe. So essentially Bolivian silver from the Spanish Empire paid for its construction. So this is the empire of the Great Qing, which achieved China's largest physical expansion of direct rule, incorporating places like Tibet and Mongolia. Now, Tibet was incorporated after the 18th century when the Tibetans sacked the Chinese capital. So the idea of Tibet being quiescent is not accurate. Its conquest was the result of a conflict between China and Tibet. And so uh, for some, the Qing dynasty, even though it was not a Han dynasty, but a Manchu governed polity, the core of the state now includes Tibet, Xinjiang, Mongolia, and Manchuria, which is not a part of the original image of China created by Han Wu Ti. And so we have to think about, again, uh, how the political imagination has been altered by more previous events, even if these delineations of Han occupation are not uh, 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 based on the ethnic Han identity. So this is the actual distribution of empires around the time that Zheng He, uh, uh, after Zheng He sent out his fleet, that was a part of the Ming Dynasty, that collapsed and was re replaced with the Qing Dynasty from uh, Manchuria, which is now Jilin and Heilongjian uh, provinces in the extreme uh, northeast of China. That's the light green. You can see that terrestrially it's very powerful. Um, and this is, this is uh, after the, uh, during and after the 17th century. You can see the Spanish and the Portuguese empires, which at this point are almost two centuries old.
Uh, and you can see the English and the French in North America. You can see the beginnings of an English colony in Australia. Uh, the Europeans would not penetrate Africa because of the challenges of disease for the Europeans um, because of immunological problems for at least another two centuries. Uh, but you can see the power uh, of China and the fact that it didn't really see a purpose in having to expand at that time. I mean, most of its neighbors consist of the Russians who are occupying the economically uh, not very profitable taiga, the, the forest of small uh, uh, pine trees with very little agricultural soil and can see what is today Vladivostok and Khabarovsk are still under the control of the Qing dynasty, which, which does have uh, arable land. But the Russians, despite repeated attempts to penetrate that territory over three and a half centuries, did not succeed until the 1860s because of persistent defeats and, and uh, being blocked by the uh, Ming and then the Qing uh, dynasty. And you can see the Japanese polity as well, which after its uh, civil war of the 16th century, largely closed itself off uh, for about 250 years until the uh, Europeans uh, uh, showed up. So this is an alternate uh, history. Uh, you can imagine the Russians continuing their expansion. Uh, the Russians got as far as what is today Vancouver in uh, Canada and down the coast of Oregon. And you can imagine the Russians uh, continuing their push. You still have the English and the French and the Spanish, but here you've got China uh, pushing in from California, uh, which is, you know, again, conceivable and something the Chinese could have done. Because uh, if, if you look at uh, the state of California in uh, 1810, uh, you had about a quarter of a million uh, inhabitants that were uh, either Mexican uh, from the, the, the Spanish Empire uh, or were American uh, uh, former English colonists, along with 400,000 uh, for First Nations. And that demography has changed, of course. Uh, uh, California is now pushing over 40 million people, and if it was an independent country, it would be in the top 10 wealthiest countries in the world. So there, you know, there's a lot of, of room for counterfactual uh, geopolitics. The United States captured uh, California after its 1846 war with Mexico. China could have done the same thing if they had a fleet and weren't shut down. One of the consequences of losing your fleet is you lose the skill set to build ships. It takes a very long time to do that. And once China lost their fleet, they didn't regain it until the end of the 19th century uh, when they were able to contract European powers to build them several battleships. And when the Japanese destroyed those in 1895, it took China another 100 years in the 1980s and 1990s to rebuild a fleet that could protect its coast. This is uh, another uh, counterfactual of uh, China's empire expanding into what is today the Russian Far East. Instead of Catherine the Great's expansion, which took about a century uh, and was a part of the general intense European competition for territory, instead of shutting itself off, China might have anticipated uh, controlling the taiga of Siberia, not for its economic value, but because it would create a strategic barrier against European encroachment. And you know, obviously there's other areas it could have expanded into, which is Southeast Asia, and it could have gone from uh, its traditional hold in Central Asia, which it had under Han Wuti, and it could, could have penetrated into places like uh, Persia and uh, the Middle East. So here again, you can see the uh, Qing uh, dynasty uh, tributaries in uh, Southeast Asia, including Nepal. So this is what China felt uh, uh, as, as a comfortable uh, expansion. Uh, and it has influence um, and good relations all the way down into the Malay states, which is important because it's, it's uh, a key transit point for commerce for uh, Chinese exports, which culturally speaking at this time were very influential. Uh, you know, there, there are museums between uh, China and Europe in almost every major state. When I visited Indonesia, there's a whole museum there of nothing but Chinese porcelain a huge museum of every variety of Chinese porcelain. China dominated uh, world exports in the same way uh, that it does today for a lot of the uh, consumer wealth. The picture at the bottom is a European depiction of an attempt by Europeans to establish trading relations with the Manchu court, which was not positively received. China's goal was not to have a flood of foreign imports that would destabilize its own system of 
gathering revenue from uh, monopolies like uh, salt, and uh, it therefore saw no reason to trade with the Europeans, who were technically uh, certainly achieving some marvels, but nothing that the Chinese saw that would improve their ability to govern their territory. So the Western perception was that Chinese tribute, which is the extraction of, of wealth from its neighbors, neighbors consisted of um, essentially sending uh, an extortion racket kind of threat. And then the local states like Japan and Vietnam and Malaysia would then send wealth to Beijing. And so uh, Beijing would profit from being the center of this extraction of resources from its peripheral areas. This is certainly something that Rome did. And it was a common practice for states in the, in the international system to do this in the form of reparations from wars or just to collect money uh, as, a, as a protection against attack. Tribute, however, for the Chinese was a form of interlocution between different civilizations uh, that would emphasize the Chinese emperor's role as mediator of civilization. And refusal against tribute was seen as a threat against the Chinese perception of the cosmos, meaning the, the, the political and religious universe. Tribute was a way of extending influence of Chinese civilization in a type of emperor-subject relationship that was a reproduction of the Chinese emperor's relationship with Chinese subjects to the relationship between the Chinese state, Zhongguo, and other states. The subject motives varied according to their uh, identity, like uh, Vietnam, for example, it was called Annam at the time, uh, or uh, in Siam at the time, what is today Thailand. Uh, for some, it was expedient, like the uh, nomadic Turks. Uh, they would uh, pay a tribute in the form of horses, and then they would be allowed to purchase wine, or they would be allowed to export goods into the Chinese market. Now, Siam, which is today's uh, Thailand, completed its last tributary visit to Peking as late as 1858. And they did it for diplomatic reasons that benefited them. Thailand saw China as providing stability against threats from Vietnam against the Thai state. For example, the Chinese asked the, that the state of Nam Viet rename itself Vietnam, which you know formerly it would be a change from the southern Viets to Viet South, so that Vietnam would not legitimize the Vietnamese related people that are still alive in China today which are essentially the Hakka people or the Kejia people, or those Vietnamese that hadn't uh, yet transformed um, their identity and been assimilated. However, the treatment of the tributary state's visit was usually a Chinese-funded grand entry, making the act of tribute ironically more expensive for China than the tributary state. This is something the Europeans were not aware of. In effect, the tribute was pursued for the purpose of China's domestic status, not for economic purposes. So China was able to establish diplomatic influence over these other states by having these individuals come to the border. And then there would be a great procession at great expense for the Chinese state where these individuals were brought to Beijing. They would be very impressed by this demonstration of Chinese power, and they would go back to their state duly impressed not only by China's power and wealth, but also by the fact that China was very, very deferential. This is important. The Chinese were not trying to conquer territory in the way that the Europeans were. They were trying to bring some sort of order to their local political system. China also depended on tributary relations for its internal legitimacy. Remember, this is a part of their Confucian religion. Uh, the idea that they were spreading these values of justice that applied internally to China, externally as well, despite the cost of the tribute to the state. However, Chinese officials had to square away Confucian ideology and practical foreign relations. And so tribute was an expression of, of a just foreign policy. Now, it didn't mean that it was always, uh, always truthful. The Chinese in their records claim that the English gave tribute to China. And this is important for the Chinese. If they could show that even the Europeans gave them tribute, it would add legitimacy uh, to the regime in Beijing. In reality, the British never 
gave tribute to China. So the Chinese manufactured their own history for obvious benefits to the domestic legitimacy of their regime. Now trade could follow tribute along the frontier. In other words, if someone wanted to trade with China, first they would have to send tribute to China. And then China would have let them trade on some limited fashion as long as they acknowledged that Beijing's um, cosmic order and philosophy was going to be followed. Um, trade alone was very unusual. Um, and this is what the English demanded. This is what the Russians wanted. And in general, China kept them at bay because of that. The mandate of heaven could be lost if the nomads were not controlled. So the Chinese focused more on Central Asia and uh, the northern grasslands than they did on Southeast Asia. And so the rules they applied to the nomads was reproduced for these maritime Europeans who were seen as a much lesser threat and much smaller in numbers. China had difficulty dealing with Mongol and Qing occupation, you know, ethnically speaking, the Han Chinese, because it contradicted the Confucian ideology. Mongol rule was short-lived. Uh, it only lasted about 150 years. The Manchu adopted Chinese forms, even though they kept their language and they had Manchu cities located outside of most Chinese cities until the early 20th century, most of these uh, situations were erased. Now there are Manchu still alive in China today. They were discriminated against uh, under uh, even the communist uh, regime um, under Mao Zedong. Um, uh, but, so they couldn't achieve a high level of positions and they were, if they were identified as ethnically Manchu, even though, um, frankly, it was difficult to tell them visually apart uh, from the Chinese, they could be denied um, a, a certain uh, positions in universities and in education. A Russian embassy was sent to China in 1567, 1619, 1653, and uh, the Russians persistently refused to kowtow or to bow before the Chinese emperor. And so the Chinese refused them uh, commercial access, despite persistent attempts um, uh, uh, to come to some common cultural understanding about Russia's subordinate role uh, north of the Chinese border after they'd conquered all these nomadic peoples. Uh, China did send a delegation to St. Petersburg in 1733, which was equally unsuccessful. Chinese officials basically had ignorance of world geography into the 19th century. I mean, their, their, their purpose was to maintain domestic stability at this time. And, and the, the Manchu were even more hypersensitive because they were trying to maintain a non-Han regime. And so uh, they were entirely focused on maintaining domestic stability of the Han population at the expense of not physically expanding beyond the territories of Xinjiang, Xijiang, and Mongolia. Now, if you look at some of the sample um, uh, tribute relations, uh, the Burmese had been giving tribute to China since 1284. I mean, this is essentially in response to the Yuan Dynasty when the Mongols uh, moved um, into South Asia unsuccessfully and into Burma. And so this is not really tribute to Chinese, but to the Mongol governed Chinese state. Uh, during the Annamese Civil War in uh, AD 1788, which is uh, the Annamese are the uh, uh, Vietnamese state, the Chinese got involved. Obviously, they're trying to stabilize uh, their frontier. Uh, the Tibet sent a delegation to Peking in 1652, and uh, China provided help in 1720 uh, in response. So uh, th there were positive benefits to these peripheral states interacting. China provided stability. It was not... Um, uh, after the expansion of Han Wu Ti uh, and uh, of the conquest of, of uh, Tibet and Mongolia uh, and Manchuria. Well, Manchuria is already a part of the Manchu, uh, Manchu um, ethnic uh, territory. Uh, China was not looking to expand uh, territorially. And so there's a lot of deference towards uh, Beijing's goals. Uh, Leo Chiu which is uh, the Ryukyu Islands now controlled uh, by Japan, including islands like uh, Okinawa, which is a major U.S. and Japanese military base, um, played China and Japan off against each other as uh, recipients of tribute simultaneously from between 1372 to China and 1451 to Japan. Ultimately, the Japanese occupied the islands in 1875 in an attempt to preempt the European occupation of the islands, and the Japanese forcibly ended the uh, Ryukun uh, uh, Islands tribute sent to the Chinese. 
Again, the Chinese records falsify tribute received not only from the British, but from uh, Tamerlane, who's a famous Turkic Mongolic leader uh, who attacked and conquered um, much of, of uh, Asia um, from the Turkish uh, Asia Minor, what is today Turkey, all the way to Central Asia and India. China was, of course, politically traumatized by the loss of its tributary dependencies between 1860 and 1895. Liuchu, which are the uh, Ryukyu Islands, uh, including Okinawa, uh, uh, were basically taken over by Japan formally in 1881, and of course tribute had, had already uh, ended in 1875. Ili was taken over by Russia in 1881. Tonkin and Annam, basically the uh, southern and northern parts of, or rather northern and southern parts of Vietnam, um, uh, were taken over by France after 1885, uh, although they had given tribute to China from 1407 to 1885. Northern Burma stopped giving tribute in 1886 because of the British conquest. Sikkim, which is now part of India, stopped giving tribute in 1890 when the British took over. Uh, Korea, Formosa, and the Pescadores Islands uh, gave tribute uh, to China until 1894-1895 when Japan uh, took over. Siam or Thailand stopped sending tribute in 1882 uh, as a part to appease uh, English and French sensibilities. Nepal stopped sending tribute in 1882 following the British invasion. However, uh, the British and French permitted some of these polities to con continue sending tribute to China uh, depending on circumstances. So there are a fair number of exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis. And it had a lot to do with, of course, the French and the English having to rule in regions where they were outnumbered. And so it was, it was a part of their search for political stability. Now, China shares borders with uh, more countries than any other country on Earth, 14 total. These borders are mostly mountains, deserts, and uh, seas and oceans. Uh, so China is to some extent isolated and relatively geopolitically inaccessible. Much of China's current policy is to reassert its influence over this uh, political region. So China's interests in the seas near Japan and Taiwan and the South China Sea are somehow a reflection of this uh, reassertion. Despite the United Nations law of the sea, China's perception of these claims over territorial influence, while not in the European legal sense, uh, you know, maritime law has to do with salvage at sea and um, uh, up applying rules of saving people that are outside of territorial waters at sea and what happens to cargoes that are seized at sea and the consequences of piracy. Those come from a long legal tradition in Europe that go all the way back, you can trace it, all the way back to um, uh, 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 basically uh, Roman law and Rhodian law, as one of my uh, students has uh, been researching. Uh, so China's claim the South China Sea, and this includes claims by Taiwan. Uh, so you see it's, it's not a communist claim for territorial gain, it's actually a fundamental cultural claim by most uh, 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 Chinese regimes um, that trace their origins uh, to the pre-modern uh, Chinese state. So Chinese construction of islands in what the Europeans call the Spratly Islands, or the Nansha Islands, which is what uh, China calls them. And you can see here uh, the construction of the island of, of, of islands on top of the reefs in the southern part of the South China Sea. You can see those depicted on the, uh, on the right. And of course, there are many claims in this region. Uh, so you have the Philippines and Malaysia and Indonesia and Vietnam, uh, and who all claim various islands in this region. But the Chinese claim is based upon the um, uh, its, its perception of the loss of uh, tribu tributary influence um, that occurred when the Europeans and the Japanese asserted their influence in the region. So China's contemporary strategic behavior is largely explicable because of this experience of having been rolled back during the emergence of European uh, colonialism in the East Asian littoral. 
China has not conquered much territory in its border wars that it's had since its uh, the communist regime was established in 1949. So it's it's border conflict with uh, Vietnam, uh, with India, uh, with the Soviet Union in 1969 did not turn into large amounts of territory being exchanged. China is essentially trying to establish its tributary and its influence claims that go back to the Qing dynasty. China has sought, in fact, to reassure its neighbors that it has no territorial goal. It negotiated with Pakistan to secure a border over uh, some of the uh, mountainous valleys there, but China's uh, uh, exchange of territory with Pakistan was largely seen by Pakistan as both legitimate along with promises of permanence. China is very reluctant to abrogate any of these agreements because it reflects on its perception by other neighbors. And so in many ways, China is quite restrained in its attempt to overturn the uh, status quo. China has not fought any state in a war that has reached a territorial settlement with it. China deterred uh, uh, was deterred over the Senkanku Islands. These are uh, islands that are part of the Ryukyu chain, but are essentially uh, slightly north of the Ryukyu chain near Taiwan. And these are two very, very small islands that are currently um, uh, owned by Japan. They were owned by a private concern, and then Japan purchased it uh, after the transfer of the islands from U.S. control uh, to Japan. And China sometimes feeds nationalist fervor over the islands, um, but for the most part, it tries to contain nationalist fervor over it because it doesn't want to be compelled to fight over the small islands. The islands do matter, as we'll see later on in this course, because they help delineate under international law uh, control of access to natural resources having to do with the fact that the islands are located on the continental shelf. So what we want to do now is take a look at China's perception of foreign powers, uh, particularly with regard uh, to how they pose a security threat to Beijing's self-interests. So China's views of Japan. China's very suspicion of Japan. China recognizes that Japan is very modern, but it's driven by a Bushido code, a warrior code, and by at least a part of Japanese society's exaltation of violence. Japan is seen as politically not very sensitive to Chinese, to Chinese interests, history, or concerns. It doesn't have uh, um, political introspection or humility, uh, given China's attempt to explain Japan's violent behavior in the Nanjing Massacre of 1937. China sees itself as pacifist, by contrast. China is concerned about Japan's very well-equipped self-defense force, particularly its navy, and by Japan's large reserve of fissile material that it could use for uh, its uh, nuclear arsenal. China views the U.S. both as a primary threat, but also admires it as a model. China sees the U.S. as trying to hem China in by using Taiwan and the Riku Islands as a form of a containment strategy to force China to have a peaceful evolution according to U.S. moral codes, which uh, China sees actually as, as a method of infiltration. The U.S. is seen as using a Western Shifang way of war, which is realist, in other words, focused on power, expansionist, reliant on military means to achieve political ends, and emphasizing amoral material over ethical goals. So China is, it, um, sees America as unresponsive to Chinese appeals to Confucian justice. China, by contrast, uh, self-describes itself as both pacifist and principles, where Chinese foreign policy is guided by ethical principles, where U.S. foreign policy doesn't seem to be guided by uh, the, the Christian values that Americans profess to follow. So China focuses on moral cultivation as a continental power. 
where China sees the West as focused on values like courage and strength and technology and adventure and, and war as romance as a part of, of what you'd expect of a maritime culture. The U.S. is seen as offensive and expansionist and as seeking global hegemony. The U.S. is also seen as intensely anti-communist. The U.S. also is seen to engage in strategic misdirection in the way that the U.S. used missile defense to, to break the confidence of the Soviet Union or the way that the U.S. tricked Iraq to attack Kuwait and then dismembered it. Or uh, the way that the U.S. focused on targeting uh, Serbian civilians in their attack on Belgrade and in supporting Indian uh, nuclear tests. Uh, China sees the U.S. goal as ultimately dismembering China in the same way that the U.S. Uh, uh, seemed to support the dismemberment of the Soviet Union and sought the encirclement and the weakening of Russia. The weakness of the U.S., according to China, is its oscillation between realist and liberal factors. Uh, and now Beijing sees this as a weakness because it's inconsistent, although uh, the Americans see this as a source of strength uh, because the American values are as influential as American power. So China sees outcomes like the American intervention in Somalia in 1993 as essentially uh, a failure and a weakness. And it undermines the ability of the U.S. to do long-term planning because it depends on which government is in power in Washington. China sees the U.S. as over-reliant on technology, and, and uh, the U.S. is unaware of its vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and like many other powers, China sees American leaders as having a weakness in an absence of historical and moral knowledge about how the rest of the world operates. Now, this is a model that has been proposed by scholars of China on a sequence that traditional societies go through when they encounter a Western colonial challenge. And while this was originally formulated to explain the Chinese response to the Western cultural and military challenge going back several hundred years, it applies equally well to the Western challenge of societies in the Near East and South Asia and other cultures as well. So there's actually an ideational sequence that traditional cultures go through when they first encounter European cultures. Ultimately the goal is for these regimes to survive and if they're able to survive the first encounter rather than being conquered they go through a set of steps where the sharp impact of defeat forces them to try to reevaluate their culture and their behavior to try to respond to these European military challenges. The first step is these, these cultures will encounter Europeans, they'll say they'll refuse a European demand for trade or for access to a port, and there'll be a, a battle and they will lose. And the initial reaction is that, well, you know, the societies become decadent, and so this society has to uh, go back to traditional values, very, very simply. And this is sort of uh, the soldiers are told to become more traditional and religion is, is uh, basically updated. And it's important for the emperor uh, to follow moral values privately and publicly. Now, there occurs another encounter. And once again, the traditional state is defeated by the Europeans. And the solution then is for the society to become ultra conservative it's conceded that traditional values don't work. And uh, even though there's, there's been a call to return to traditional values, that call was shallow and insincere and performative and not profound. And so there's a bit of an identity crisis. And so you have an ultra traditional pursuit of values, a fundamental return to the values of political Islam or to the values of Thai culture or to uh, whatever uh, identity uh, Neo-Confucian Chinese culture is about. Now there is a third encounter with these European attackers. The Europeans again win and it's realized that values are insufficient. And typically, military people that survive, if the state has survived this far, realize that the Europeans have a technical advantage. They look at the weapons. And so there is an attempt 
to emulate the technical advantages of the Europeans. So European cannon makers are hired. European mercenaries are hired to train the army. And you have a shallow emulation of the empire. So you have an army with some elements of military force and uh, with modern technology and almost a, a, a technological fetishism where the machines themselves are seen to uh, give status and power. And so you have a, a very shallow adoption of this technology without the doctrine, without the training. Uh, and then you have a battle. Once again, the Europeans win. Here, the society has a major shock. They realize that they have failed to adopt the technology because they've not accepted the dramatic cultural changes that need to be undertaken in order for the technology to take root and to be properly used. And this requires changing society. So these societies set up military academies that are modern. They erase their former culture. They copy the doctrine of these Europeans. They not only adopt the technology, but they remove older social forms. And so the society has made a painful alteration to their society to deal with the new threat. Now many countries don't go past the stage. Repeated defeats of Egypt by Israel in their various Arab-Israeli wars from uh, 40, uh, 47 to 56 to 67 to 73 Egypt was repeatedly militarily defeated and the Egyptians made a choice not to evolve their society in response to the Israeli challenge. And so many societies at some points will give up if they see that they, uh, because making a social transformation is difficult and so if there's not ex an existential threat. And for the Egyptians there was no Israeli desire to occupy the Nile Valley, the Egyptians uh, prioritize uh, their uh, preserving their social culture. But a country like China, which faced occupation by uh, and penetration by European interests, clearly had a motive not to be conquered. And the large Japanese conquest of Beijing in 1931 and then Shanghai in 1937 meant that the Japanese uh, had occupied the northern Chinese uh, plain where the majority of Chinese lived. And a tr tr there was tremendous death as a result of the 1931 to 1945 invasion of China by Japan. And of course, Japan had an earlier presence starting in 1895. So the fifth step occurs when this modern Chinese army or foreign, this local army marches out and gets defeated by the Europeans again, despite having made a major sacrifice. And here it comes down to, we just can't change our culture anymore. We just can't adopt any more of the technology. And here you get the fifth step where the society adopts the antithesis of the current philosophy in the opponent. And for the Chinese, it was adopting Marxism as an internal critique of European state and society. And so the Chinese adopted Marxism because they thought they saw this as a European response to their own culture, where the Europeans were vulnerable. Now the Chinese, of course, use it for very different reasons, as the Soviet Union did. It was basically a method of control. But the key principle was it had a revolutionary element which justified overriding the traditional culture before on a mass scale to, to achieve a level of mobilization that the Europeans were able to achieve. Instead of having a very small army with a reluctant population that didn't share the vision of, of the culture and the state. And so this is the final step. Uh, political Islam never got this far. China's uh, Marxism did. It got to the fifth step. Uh, and this finally allowed it to achieve the amount of power necessary to overcome the European slash Japanese imperial challenge to China.